it's time for another audiobook. And this one um, was actually a book that had a different name for a long, long time. And then I decided to pull it out of a series. And when I pulled it up and read through it, I was like, whoa, how much have I grown? And I needed to make some changes. So I added a whole bunch of words. I edited it. I um, added some new scenes and of course made it a lot longer, gave it a new name. And so I'm excited for you guys to listen to An Unexpected Love. Hopefully you guys love it. See ya. Chapter One, Boston, Massachusetts, 1883. Mary Catherine Whidbey, or Kate, as her family called her, pressed her lips together as she watched the dirt fall onto the wooden casket that housed her mother. Every thud was like a knife to her heart. Her father had been taken a year prior in an accident, and though her mother had tried to remain strong, her broken heart had finally caught up to her. Well, that and the influenza that had run through the town a month ago. But Kate was convinced it was her mother's broken heart that made her susceptible to the influenza. A hand touched her arm, and Kate looked up to find the weathered and wrinkly eyes of Mr. Tanner staring at her. His thinning white hair barely covered his balding pate, and deep creases marred much of his face. He was at least twice her age, if not more, but he'd had his eye on her since her father's funeral. I'm so sorry for your loss, Mary Catherine. Kate bit the inside of her cheek to keep her sarcastic reply to herself. She hated being called by her formal name, although perhaps in Mr. Tanner's case, it was just as well that he didn't use her informal moniker but she did not believe for a second that he was truly sorry for her loss. In fact, she wouldn't put it past him to propose marriage, like he had at her father's funeral. He seemed incapable of taking no for an answer. Though she was not brazen enough to ask, Kate was almost positive that he was simply looking for a woman to take care of him as his health deteriorated. His own wife had passed a few years prior, and Kate had ascertained through the rumor mill that his children had no interest in taking care of him. Not that Kate could blame them. From what she knew of Mr. Tanner, cantankerous might be too kind of a description. Still, she should consider his proposal. It was one thing to dismiss it when her mother was still alive, and she could claim she needed to remain single to be her mother's caretaker. But now that her mother was also gone, her situation was more pressing. Society did not permit her to live by herself, which meant that she would have to join her brother in his residence. And while that situation was not ideal, her brother had recently married, and his wife Abigail was not a fan of Kate's. My offer still stands, Mary Catherine. I could use a woman to keep my house in order. I know you are not much for womanly duties, but I could make an exception since you are so easy on the eyes. His lecherous gaze traveled the length of her body, and Kate shivered. Thank you, Mr. Tanner, but I am afraid my answer is still no. She took a step back, allowing her distance to remove his hand from her arm. He did not try to close the distance, but anger flashed in his eyes. You will change your mind, Mary Catherine. Of that I am sure. When he turned and walked away, Kate let out the breath she'd been holding in a sigh. She would have to do something, but she could not marry that man. Every fiber in her body believed it would be a giant mistake. Kate, how are you doing? Kate relaxed at the quiet, peaceful voice of her friend. Anna was a kind and sweet woman who, unlike Kate, had mastered the art of being content, taking care of a home, and had married a nice man a few months ago. The two women tried to keep in contact as often as they could, but that was growing difficult now that Anna was expecting her first child. I am unsure what to do next, Anna. Kate would not share that information with most people, but she knew that Anna would keep her secret. Anna nodded sagely and leaned closer as she whispered, 
I suppose Mr. Tanner was proposing once again. He was, and I turned him down again, but the only other proposal I have received was from Jonathan James, and he is not a Christian man. Kate shivered as she pictured Jonathan James's stern face. Instead of age etching out the lines on his face, a hard life and alcohol had. The woman worked at the Bell in Hand Tavern, a place that Kate would never condone nor step foot inside, and she had no idea if he really wanted to marry her or was hoping he could put her to work if he was her husband. She had no intention of finding out. So what are you going to do? Kate surveyed the small cemetery. The ceremony had not been large, and most of the attendees were now making their way home. She would have to leave as soon as her brother was ready. I do not know. My training is lacking in any area I could seek employment, and there have been no reasonable prospects. Well, there is one option you may not have thought of yet. What is that? You could answer a mail-order bride request in the paper. Kate's eyes widened and her hand flew to her chest. What? I could do no such thing. That would mean moving across the country to live with a total stranger. Anna's brow lifted. Would it be worse than living with Abigail? Kate sighed and shook her head. Probably not. I can understand her need to make her house her home, but I do not understand her cruel treatment. Sincerity flooded Anna's eyes. Have you talked to Robert about the situation? Kate shook her head again. He is being kind enough to take me in, but he is not the brother I remember. Ever since father passed, he has been gruffer and more easily riled. He does not take his responsibility lightly, but I do not want to add to his concerns. Then I think you must consider the other option. I have a few friends who answered such ads, and while they say work out west is difficult, they have found happiness with the men they chose to marry. Kate lifted her chin and pulled back her shoulders. I am not afraid of hard work, but I am not convinced that is the right option. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Robert approaching and knew she needed to terminate the conversation with her friend. However, I will pray about it. Thank you, Anna. As she leaned in to give Anna a quick embrace, her friend whispered in her ear, and I will be praying for you. Kate, it is time. Robert's stern voice left no room for argument, and Kate flashed a small wave to her friend as she fell into step with her brother. We will stop at the estate to pick up whatever you need and get you settled in our house tonight. Must we? Abigail asked, linking her arm through Robert's. Couldn't she stay at the estate a few days to pack everything up? It would not be proper for her to stay there alone. Besides, the bank will be keeping most of the items with the house. Kate's heart clenched at the thought of all the items she would be forced to leave at the house. She knew that items were just things, but they were the only things she had left to remember her parents by and the thought of someone from the bank stuffing them away in trunks brought tears to her eyes. She quickly blinked them back. She was Mary Catherine Whidbey, and she would not cry. Sage Creek, Texas, 1883 Jesse Jennings removed his hat and wiped the sweat from his brow. The heat was beating down fiercely today, and his eyes burned from the sweat trickling into them but at least the last fence post was in. With his cattle once again safe, he would now be able to focus on putting the finishing touches on his homestead so he could marry Pauline. That was the light at the end of the very hot tunnel. As he replaced his hat, the sound of horse hooves carried through the air. Jesse turned and watched until the form of Sheriff Johnson could be made out. Stifling a sigh, Jesse lifted his gaze to the lawman. What can I do for you, Sheriff? It was a question he didn't really need to ask because he knew the answer. Sheriff Johnson had come around once every few days like clockwork the last few weeks 
to try and enlist Jesse as a deputy sheriff. He could appreciate the man having confidence in him, but Jesse had no interest in law enforcement. Sure, he enjoyed the protection the law provided as much as the next person, but he was just a simple rancher, and all he wanted to do was marry his sweetheart and raise cattle. Unfortunately, time and money had dwindled after some rough winter weather and the previous summer's drought, extending the finishing of the homestead. You know why I'm here, Jesse, the older man said as he dismounted his chocolate brown stallion. There was another robbery last night, this time at Doc Moore's office. No one was hurt, but they took a lot of his supplies. We need more men to help patrol, at least until we catch these varmints. He removed his hat and ran his leathery hand through his salt and pepper hair. I'm sorry to hear that, Sheriff, but as I've told you before, I'm not a lawman, and I need to finish this homestead and get the crops ready for farming this summer. Sheriff Johnson planted his hands on his slim hips and donned his hat again. Well, I can sit with that, but the attacks appear to be becoming more frequent. I just hope you still have a home when all is said and done. With that, Sheriff Johnson tipped the brim of his black Stetson before remounting his horse. Jesse lifted a hand in a loose wave and watched the sheriff recede from view. Maybe Sheriff Johnson was right. He was young and in shape and not half bad with a gun if he did say so himself. Plus, the position was bound to pay a little. He could certainly use some money to start his life with Pauline. But not right now. Once he finished the homestead, he'd be able to think about it. Right now, thoughts of Pauline with her long blonde hair consumed his thoughts. Jesse checked the sun on the horizon. It had sunk low, leaving the sky a brilliant orange and pink color. He had lost track of time and needed to wash up before dinner with Pauline. They did not occupy the same homestead yet, but he tried to attend dinner with her every night he could. Setting up consistent habits was something he thought important. Chapter 2 Kate took a deep breath and glanced around before entering the store. It wasn't like she was doing anything illegal or even illicit but the thought of combing through the paper for a husband still felt foreign to her. Thankfully, there were few customers in the store to notice her, and she was able to grab a local paper and make her way to the corner to read in private without any questions. While the thought of leaving her beloved Boston left a disgusting taste in her mouth, she was quickly approaching the spinster age of 25, and all the men around her seemed intimidated by her brains, or, more likely, her strong-willed spirit, as her brother Robert liked to remind her. Well, not all the men, unfortunately, but any decent man that she might be interested in pursuing a relationship with, anyway. Unfortunately, Kate had always held a grand notion of love, especially after watching the relationship of her parents. So agreeing to marry a complete stranger sent an unsettling feeling through her stomach every time she thought about it. But her options had run out when her mother had joined her father in heaven. Kate glanced around one more time to be sure no one was watching, then she opened the paper and scanned until she found the ads she was looking for. 40-year-old widowed rancher, 5 foot 7 and 150 pounds, looking for wife who can be mother to his 3 kids. 3 kids. Kate shook her head and drew a line through that one. While she wanted kids one day, she didn't feel confident stepping into the role immediately. 50-year-old pastor, 5 foot 8, 180 pounds, seeks wife for companionship and to lead women's socials at local church. A pastor's wife wouldn't be too bad, but the age difference was more than Kate could stomach. 
After all, she was barely 25, which would make this man twice her age. And wasn't the lifespan shorter in the West? Knowing her luck, he would die shortly after she arrived, and she'd be left all alone. 30-year-old bar owner, 5 foot 7, 140 pounds, seeks wife and possible waitress. While this one was closer in age, Kate had no desire, or skills for that matter, to work in a bar. If she wanted to pursue that avenue, she could just entertain Jonathan James's offer. The pickings were slim this month, it seemed. Just one ad left. 32-year-old farmer, 5 foot 9 inches, 180 pounds, in search of brave woman to help on homestead. Well, she didn't know much about farming, or what help on a homestead might entail, but no one would say Kate wasn't brave. She had even taken shooting lessons with her brother and father. Closing her eyes, she sent a plea up to God for guidance. There was no voice in her ear, but her anxiety about answering the ad lessened. Crossing her fingers this man wouldn't be a con man or an abuser, she made her way to the counter. Hello, Miss Kate. What can I help you with today? Mr. Gaines was the elderly owner of the newspaper. He wore a black vest over his shirt, and a pair of old spectacles sat on the bridge of his nose but it was his smile that always put her at ease. Mr. Gaines always seemed to have a smile and a kind word for his customers, even when it was clear he was battling his own issues. Kate cleared her throat and dropped her eyes to the counter, still embarrassed to be doing this. I wanted to inquire how I might go about answering an ad. She pushed the paper across to him and pointed at the ad. Hmm, let me see. He lifted the paper with one hand while pushing up his glasses with the other. Mail order bride? He lowered the paper to look at Kate. Does that mean we're losing you? A heated flush flared across Kate's face. Well, there isn't much left for me here with my mother and father gone. Don't you still have a brother? Mr. Gaines asked kindly. Kate nodded. I do, but Robert just married, and he's trying to get his practice up and running. I would just be in the way. She didn't add the fact that his wife Abigail appeared to despise her, and the thought of staying in their house much longer held little appeal. Well, if you're sure, he said, though the tone of his voice told her he wasn't convinced. He reached below the cabinet and pulled out a pad of paper and a pencil. Generally, you write the man back, and a correspondence ensues to see if it's a good fit. Oh, Kate stammered. She had not realized she would need to reply with more than an acceptance. Thank you. She took the pad of paper and the pencil. I will return this shortly. Kate headed back to the corner and sat down at the table, thinking for a moment. What was she supposed to say? Was she supposed to include her physical description as well? She'd thought it was a little odd that heights and weights were a part of the ad, but she supposed physical appearance was still important, even through the mail. She placed the pencil on the paper and scribbled out. Dear Sir, my name is Kate Whidbey. I am a brave 25-year-old woman, 5 foot 7 inches and 120 pounds. I have dark hair and blue eyes and am looking for love and adventure in a new area. I saw your ad in my paper, and although I do not know much about farming, I am a quick study and think I could be the woman you are looking for. Please advise if this is acceptable. I would like to travel as soon as possible. Kate Whidbey She folded the letter and returned to Mr. Gaines. Do you have an envelope I could use to send this? Mr. Gaines supplied one from under the counter and handed it to her. Kate quickly jotted her name and address down and sealed the envelope. She held it out to Mr. Gaines, but he shook his head. I'm sorry, I can't handle it from here. Take it to the post office. 
They will send it out, and your response will come back through them. Oh. Kate retracted her arm, tucking the envelope close to her chest, and trying to force back the heat she could feel crawling up her neck. How long do you think it will take to get a reply? I don't know for sure, but my guess would be about two weeks. Kate's jaw dropped open. Two weeks? She didn't know what she had expected since the mail traveled by horseback, but two weeks each way would mean another few months in her brother's house, and she wasn't sure she could handle it. Mr. Gaines nodded and scratched the side of his bald head with the back of the pencil. Yes, ma'am, unless you'd like to telegraph it. That costs considerably more, though. Kate fingered the few coins she had managed to find in her parents' bedroom as she was packing up the last items she'd been able to take. No, she had better be frugal and spend only a little. No, two weeks is fine. Perhaps she could find a temporary job. It would be nice to have some money for the trip. Kate left the store and stopped at the post office dropping off the letter and paying the small fee before she continued on to the mercantile to pick up a few items. Once inside the store, she loaded the basket with the necessities, flour, sugar, teas, and then picked up a few pieces of penny candy. Kate felt guilty for imposing on Robert and Abigail by staying with them at their house, especially so early in their marriage. But her parents had rented their house, and as Kate had stayed home to care for her parents, she had no money to continue the payments after their death. Plus, society frowned on women living alone, so she had been forced to move out. Morning, Miss Kate. Sally, the plump owner of the mercantile, smiled at her as she approached the counter. Kate had often wondered how Sally had married before she did. But, like Anna, Sally embraced the role society expected of women. So, while she might not have the perfect physical figure men were looking for, she had the personality they wanted. Besides, technically, Kate had received two marriage proposals. Funny how she had rebuffed those proposals because she felt the men didn't have pure intentions. Yet now she was planning to travel across the country and marry a man she'd never met and whose intentions she definitely did not know. Hello, Sally, she said, placing the items on the counter. How is business? It is not too bad. Sally smiled, but it was a hesitant one. Then she glanced behind her and leaned forward, whispering this time, Tell you the truth, it has been a little slow the last few months. John is stressed about it. Kate smiled and leaned in to reply. Well, I will keep praying it will pick up. A ray of relief flooded Sally's face, and she began tabulating the cost of the items. That is mighty kind of you, Kate. Will I see you at church on Sunday? Of course, I would not miss it. Kate never missed a service if she could help it, but Sally's questions sent her mind spinning. God was an important part of her life. Would there be proper churches in Texas? She grabbed her bag of supplies, but the question continued to plague her as she made her way to Robert's house. I think you should think about it, Pauline said as she spooned soup into Jessie's bowl. I've heard the robberies have been getting more frequent, and the sheriff could use more good men. She placed his bowl on the table and surveyed the table to make sure all the bowls were filled. I agree, her mother Iris said from the stove, where she was pulling out bread to go with dinner. The smell of yeast filled the air as small wisps of steam drifted from the loaf. Your father said he heard tell of another stagecoach getting robbed in Opdyke West. That's not far from here, and the whole business makes me nervous. Jessie grabbed Pauline's hand as her mother turned back to the stove. 
If I become a deputy, it would mean delaying the homestead even more. I want it to be finished for when we marry, and I have a hankering to be married already. Pauline placed her empty hand on his cheek, and he leaned into her soft palm. We've waited this long, Jesse Jennings. We can wait a little longer. Besides, I would feel guilty moving into our nice new home while other people's houses and businesses are still being attacked. Jesse smiled and shook his head. That is why I love you, Pauline Masterson. You have such a good heart. He wrapped an arm around her waist to bring her closer so he could take in her sweet smell. But she pushed him away and crossed to her chair. We are not going to let this soup get cold, Jessie, she said playfully. I worked too hard on it. Now sit. Yes, ma'am, Jessie said, taking his seat. He smiled as he placed his napkin on his lap. I would sure hate for anything you make to go to waste. A soft pink color tinged Pauline's fair cheeks as she sat across from him. Well, it should just be another minute, Iris said, placing the bread on the table. The cabin door banged open, and Pauline's father Caleb and her brother James entered. You weren't about to start without us, were you? James was tall and beefy, and his frame filled the doorway. Pauline's father was slightly shorter, but nearly as broad-shouldered. While Pauline was slender, Jessie wondered if the large bone structure would run in her genes when they had children of their own. No, we were waiting, Pauline said. I just dished the stew so it should still be warm. Yes, come and sit, her mother said, patting the empty place at the table beside her. I am sorry we're late, James said, limping into the large room that served as the main living space. He scowled down at his foot. It takes me longer to finish chores now since my accident. James had the habit of frequenting the saloon a little too often, and a skirmish one night had ended with shots fired. One had hit his foot, shattering the bone. It looks as though your foot is healing, though, Jesse said, as James made it to the table and fell into the chair to his right. Caleb took the chair to Jesse's left. Humph, James mumbled through a mouthful of soup. As usual, he had not waited to pray, but had simply dug into the meal. Manners did not seem to be a priority to James. But Jesse did not know if that was due to the accident or had always been part of his personality. Well, let's not let the food get cold, Iris said ignoring James's slurping and picking up her own spoon. Jesse lowered his head to say a silent prayer and then smiled at Pauline who had done the same. The rest of her family often forgot to pray at meals, but he and Pauline never missed the opportunity. Jesse could not wait until they were married and it could be just her and him at every meal. Though James and her parents served as decent chaperones, they made less than stellar dinner companions. The rest of the dinner passed in an uncomfortable silence, and Jesse found himself relieved when it ended. After Pauline and her mother had cleaned the dishes, Jesse gathered his things to go, and Pauline walked him to the front door. Jesse reached for her hand, but a cough from James forced him to drop it back to his side. Jesse wanted to take her in his arms and feel her soft lips against his. But if holding hands was frowned upon, that would definitely have to wait a little longer. Good night, Pauline, he said with a bow. I look forward to another meal tomorrow. Jesse's family was no longer living, but Pauline's family had been kind enough to offer him a chair for dinner each night. I do as well she said, and smiled her sweet smile at him. Chapter 3 Kate glanced at Robert and tried to gauge his mood. She suspected he wouldn't like her news, but she would have to tell him sooner or later. 
Tonight, at least, he appeared to be in a good mood. There's something I need to tell you, Robert. He shoved a bite of food in his mouth and chewed before asking, What is that? I answered a mail-order bride ad the other day. She said the words quickly and then pressed her lips together to await his reaction. It didn't take long. You did what? Robert asked, his fork clattering on the plate as it fell from his hand. I answered a mail-order bride ad, Kate repeated, as she scooped mashed potatoes on her plate. She glanced quickly at Robert before dropping her gaze to her plate. You cannot go halfway across the country to marry a man you've never met, Robert said, slamming his hand against the table with enough force to send the cutlery dancing and eliciting a gasp from Abigail. Kate bit the inside of her lip to calm her words before speaking. Robert was a year younger than she was, but he had tried to step into her father's role since their parents' death. She appreciated his sacrifice, but unfortunately, he had pushed harder than Kate thought her father would have. I do not have much choice, Kate said. I turned down the few marriage proposals I had, and there have not been any more. And what was wrong with those men? Robert asked, folding his arms across his chest and fixing her with a steely gaze. Well, one is nearly twice my age and always looks at me with a lecherous gaze, and the other is not a Christian, Kate returned. He works at the tavern. Perhaps if you engaged in proper activities like other women do, there might be more prospects, Robert said, with a pointed look in her direction. I think it is a wonderful idea, Abigail piped up from the end of the table. Her words sounded sweet, but the false sincerity dripped like honey from her tone. Goodness knows we can barely afford feeding another mouth around here. Her fake smile melted as she shot Kate a disapproving look. I don't like it. Robert ignored the insult his wife had sent Kate's direction, which only intensified Kate's belief that she had to get out of this house. What if this man turns out to be a bank robber or some other kind of hoodlum? I seriously doubt an outlaw would advertise in the newspaper, Kate said, taking a sip of her tea. But as for the rest, I will have to leave that in God's hands. Robert opened his mouth to argue further, but Kate had stopped him with her trusting God comment. It was something neither of them were very good at but which Kate had resolved to be better. When will you receive word back? Robert asked, with resignation in his voice. Mr. Gaines said it would take about two weeks to get an initial reply, Kate said. I do not know what other correspondence might be required after that. Well, then I will use that time to pray this isn't God's will and that the man will find someone else, Robert said as he reached for another piece of chicken. His decisive tone let her know this conversation would continue no further. Fine, Kate agreed, but if he answers yes, you will have to let me go. Agreed. Robert ended the conversation with a curt nod. Kate dropped her hands to her lap and folded them together in a nervous gesture. This next question was bound to incense Robert once again. Do you know of anyone looking for short-term work? She glanced up at him before returning her eyes to her lap. I would like to save up a little more before making the trip, and of course, I would like to help around here for the time I remain. She flashed a smile at Abigail. For a trip you are not even sure you are making yet? Robert's volume had risen again, and the vein at the base of his neck bulged, as it often did when he grew angry. Red flooded his face like a crimson tide. The school is looking for someone, Abigail spoke up. One of the regular teachers was forced to take a few weeks to visit an ailing family member. I am sure even you could handle teaching for a few weeks. 
Kate let the insult slide as she mulled the prospect over in her mind. While she wasn't formally educated, her parents could not afford college for her, she had pored over Robert's books and taught herself a great deal. Surely teaching a few students wouldn't be too hard for a week or so. That might be agreeable. I will look into it tomorrow. Perhaps spending some time as a teacher will quell this silly notion in your head as well, Robert said. Perhaps, but Kate knew she could not continue living with Robert and Abigail much longer. Jesse looked up from where he was patching holes in the barn as the thundering of hoofprints approached. What in the world? He wasn't expecting company, and it was nearly lunchtime which was an odd time for someone to visit. His hand moved to the hilt of his Colt revolver, but before he had time to pull it out, a shot whizzed by his ear, knocking him off his feet. Why was someone shooting at him? Seconds later, three horses carrying masked men flew past him. From his position on the ground, Jesse aimed and fired, The first shot went wide, but he rolled up on his knee and focused for the second shot. It didn't knock the rider from his horse, but he heard the man's yelp as they disappeared in a cloud of dust. Jesse wondered if these men were the ones who had been robbing the town. He raced to his horse Molly, who was tied up a few yards away. But before he could mount her, two more horses and riders arrived. Which way did they go? Sheriff Johnson asked. To the west, Jesse said, swinging his leg up and over the saddle. If we hurry, we can catch them. I believe I wounded one. Sheriff Johnson shook his head. No, it's too late now. You best come back to town with us, though, Jesse. A feeling of dread filled Jesse's insides. His stomach nodded as if it was filled with rocks instead of the remnants of his breakfast. Why? What happened? They were robbing the bank, Jesse, the sheriff said. Jesse shook his head, still not comprehending. We returned fire, but some of their shots went wide as they were bolting. One hit Pauline as she was coming out of the general store. Is Pauline all right? Jesse's words felt tight, strangled in his throat and he was glad he was on his horse because his knees felt as if they would collapse beneath him if he tried to stand. You need to get to town, the sheriff said. She's at Doc Moore's. Jesse did not wait to follow the sheriff and the deputy with him. Instead, he gave Molly a swift kick, something he rarely did, and led the charge himself back to town. Jesse had opted to live on the outskirts of town, so he would have more land to ranch. But he cursed that decision now as the minutes ticked by. If anything happened to Pauline. When he finally reached the clinic, Jesse jumped off Molly and threw her reins around the hitching post in one deft movement before mounting the steps and throwing the door to the clinic open. Doc Moore, an elderly man with a full head of white hair, looked up as he entered. He sat near the bed where Pauline was laid out, her blonde hair streaked with red from a wound in her temple. Pauline. The word was barely more than a whisper as Jesse crossed the distance and fell to his knees before her. He picked up her hand, surprised to find it still warm. Jesse turned his question-filled eyes on Doc Moore. She's resting right now. Doc Moore said. The wound on her temple was just a graze of a stray bullet. It's the one that hit her stomach that is the problem. Pauline's eyes slowly opened, but they were not the same green Jesse was used to seeing. They had faded to a dull gray and appeared cloudy. She tried to smile, but the effort sent her coughing, and a trickle of red ran out of her mouth. Jesse grabbed the handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the blood away. I'm glad you are here, Jesse. Her raspy voice scratched scars in his heart. Don't try to talk, Jesse said, sniffing back tears as he caressed her hair. I don't have long, she said and coughed again. 
but I wanted to tell you that one of the men has a scar on the back of his hand, a half moon. Jessie nodded. I'll find him, Pauline. I will. She shook her head. Don't look for vengeance, Jessie. Protect the town. You have no excuse not to now. A deep cough shook her body, and another, larger stream of blood flowed out of her mouth. Remember that I love you. I love you too, Jesse said, but his words were too late. He could almost see the life leave Pauline as her eyes turned glassy and remained fixed on a point past his shoulder. No! Jesse cried out and placed his forehead on Pauline's forearm. No! I'm sorry, Jesse, Doc Moore said, patting his shoulder. There was nothing I could do but make her comfortable. Jesse didn't bother looking up. With his face hidden, he could let the tears flow and the rage build. The doctor stayed by his side another few minutes, but finally he heard the man stand and move to another room to give him some privacy. I will avenge your death, Pauline, Jesse whispered to the woman he had loved for the last three years. I will find the men who did this, and they will pay. Jesse ran a rough hand across his eyes and pushed himself up from the bedside. With a single-minded focus, he strode across the room and flung the front door open. Sheriff Johnson and one of the deputies stood on the porch, their hats in their hands. Make me a deputy today, Jesse said, his voice cold and flat. They will not strike here again. Chapter 4 Kate fell into the chair behind the desk and sighed. Teaching was a lot harder than she had imagined. There were 23 children in her class, and most were boys. Rowdy, rambunctious boys. They had assigned her the primary grades as she had no higher-level education. Although she had a curriculum, she spent more of her time dealing with classroom management than she often did instructing. It was exhausting work, both mentally and physically. At least today was Friday. That gave her two whole days to relax before school opened again on Monday. She took one more deep breath and gathered up her papers and books. If she was lucky, she would have just enough time to check at the post office about her response before it closed. She had adopted the habit of stopping by the post office on the way home, but tonight the boys had been particularly feisty and school had run late. Kate locked the schoolroom door and tucked the key in the pocket of her blue cotton dress before setting out. Normally, Mr. Prescott, who worked the afternoon shift, would shake his head as she entered the post office, and she would smile and try to hide her disappointment. But today, he was waiting for her at the door. As soon as he saw her approaching, his eyes lit up and he gestured for her to follow him inside. Kate quickened her pace, excited to see what her future held. Mr. Prescott reached the back counter and waited for her to arrive. He held a white envelope in his hands. An envelope came today, Miss Kate. Kate was surprised to see her hand shaking as she reached for the envelope. She thought that she had made peace with whatever the decision would be, but suddenly her mouth was dry and her heart beat erratically in her chest. She turned the envelope over and slid one finger under the seal. The paper seemed to tear in slow motion, and a folded piece of paper poked out. Kate pulled it out, unfolded it, and scanned the words. Dear Ms. Whidbey, I would be delighted to have you come to Lisbon, Texas, to be my wife. You sound like a woman who could handle herself in the West. I have enclosed a ticket for the third Friday in April. I look forward to meeting you soon. Mr. Bill Easterly. Bill Easterly. Now she had a name and a place. She wished she had more than that, but she had agreed to leave this in God's hands. 
she had to trust that since Mr. Easterly had accepted her, that it was God's will for her to marry him. Did you receive what you were hoping for? Mr. Prescott didn't know the entire story, but Kate figured he must be curious about her daily visits. I did. I answered a mail-order bride advertisement, and this response contains his agreement and a ticket. She held the small stub out. I suppose I am moving to Texas. Kate had thought she would feel excitement at the news, but the only emotion she could pinpoint was shock. This was actually happening. The thought that perhaps she should have corresponded more with him flooded her mind. But her uncomfortable living situation had hastened the process. Thank you, Mr. Prescott, she said, refolding the paper and tucking it in her pocket beside the school key. Best of luck, Mr. Prescott called as she headed toward the entrance in a daze. Thank you, she said. The third Friday in April was the end of next week. She would have just one more week with her brother and four more days with the students. Suddenly, the impending move felt too fast, but there was no turning back now. Jesse looked down at the star on his shirt and shook his head. The star gave him authority, but it was just a symbol. It did not make him feel very different, and there had been no big ceremony, just the sheriff asking him if he promised to protect the town, and him agreeing. The other deputy had stood in as a witness, and in a matter of minutes the ceremony was over, and Jesse was a deputy. Now can we go after Pauline's killers? He asked the other men. No, Jesse, the sheriff said. We don't know where those men are. We do not have the manpower to scour the countryside looking for them. Our job is to protect the town here, at least until we have an idea of where to go. Then we can form a posse and go after them. Jesse wanted to argue. He wanted to tear out of the room, mount Molly, and go in search of the robbers himself. But as he looked at the two other men in the room, he realized they also had people important in their lives. Wives and sons and daughters. As much as he wanted to avenge Pauline's death, he also did not want anyone else feeling the pain he did at this moment. Fine, he said with a sigh, and a mental promise to never stop searching for the men responsible in his own time. What do we do now, then? We take turns patrolling. Jeb Green, the other deputy, said. He had salt and pepper streaks through his hair similar to the sheriff's and a weathered face to match. Jeb was one of the Green brothers who had been part of the original settlement of the town. That sounds fine, Jesse said with a curt nod. Where should I patrol? We have a rotation, the sheriff said, pointing to a scribbled list on the wall. One person stays here to watch any prisoners and be ready in case anyone in town needs help. The other two patrol the town borders. We lost Dixon yesterday in the bank robbery, but with the addition of you, Jesse, there are still three of us. Jesse glanced at the other men, and guilt filled his conscience. In his grief over Pauline, he had forgotten Dixon had been killed as well, and these men were probably upset too. Jeb, why don't you take Jesse and show him the patrol route, the sheriff continued. I will hold down the fort here. Jesse nodded, though he wondered if there was a better way, as the patrols yesterday hadn't stopped the robbery or the killings from happening. He followed Jeb out to where their horses were tied up. With a swift motion, he untied the reins and then swung up and mounted Molly, who had been a gift from his mother the summer before she died. Pale and sickly, his mother had never fully adjusted to the rigor of the West and had caught a fever ten years ago and never recovered. While his father had been broken, Jesse had been even more so, and when he was old enough, he had left the small town in East Texas and traveled further west, stopping in Sage Creek when he found a job 
and the possibility of owning his own land. After a year of working with a rancher on the outskirts of town, mending his fences and wrangling his cattle, he had earned enough to buy a small piece of land of his own. A year later, he had met Pauline. Pauline, who, without knowing it, had inspired him to start his own ranch. It hadn't been easy, but he now had enough livestock to make a decent living. Unfortunately, he no longer had Pauline to share that life with. It isn't a perfect system, Jeb said, as he led the way out of town. But we ride in a slow circle around the town, paying closest attention to the road to Lisbon and the road from Belleville, as that is where this pack of bandits seems to come from most often. Yesterday we rode together, but after what happened, I'm going to suggest we each take half of the perimeter. Perhaps that will make it harder for them to sneak past us. All right, Jesse said with a succinct nod. He knew the likelihood of the men hitting again today was small, but he hoped they would be stupid enough to try it, and that he'd be the one they crossed. Chapter 5 Kate stood on the train platform, a bundle of nerves. Her clothes and toiletries were packed in her carpet bag, which she gripped tightly in her hand. Her mother's wedding dress, shoes, and a few other sentimental items were packed in her trunk, which was already on the train. Are you sure you want to do this? Robert asked. Worry lines marred his forehead, and his hazel eyes were filled with concern. You can stay with us as long as it takes, Kate. Kate glanced at Abigail, who, while smiling, still had the ability to hold Kate in a cold stare. I know I could, Robert, she said, returning her attention to him. But I do feel this is where God is leading me. I will not deny I am a little apprehensive but I believe he will protect and provide for me. You better write, Robert said, as he pulled her in for a fierce hug. Kate would miss pieces of Boston, like the library and the stables. She doubted the West would have an expansive library like Boston did, and she had no idea if she would be able to have her own horse and ride daily. In fact, the West probably wouldn't have some of the finer amenities she was used to. But more than those, she would miss Robert. They had been distant growing up, but after the death of their parents, they had become closer. And though she would not miss his sometimes overbearing demeanor, he was the only blood relative she had left. That alone created a bond that could not be broken. She would not, however, miss the insulting comments from Abigail, or the cool stares often passed her direction during mealtimes. She had never felt such a dichotomy of being family, but feeling like an unwanted guest. Of course I will. Emotion constricted Kate's throat. She had not expected leaving to be so hard. Even quitting the school had been more emotional than she had expected. While the older boys had not seemed to care she was leaving, one of the younger boys had run up and hugged her legs. Surprised, she had patted his hair, promising him their regular teacher would be returning soon. Her words had not consoled him, and the image of his crocodile tears streaming down his dirty face would remain seared in her mind for many months. All aboard! The shout from the train conductor ended Kate's memory of the day before. I suppose I should be going, Kate said with a sigh. I will write as soon as I arrive. Before Robert could say anything further, Kate hurried on to the train. She chose a seat at a window and waved to them. Moments later, the train surged forward as it pulled out of the station. Is this seat taken? Kate looked up to see an older woman, clad all in black, looking down at her. No, it's free. Kate picked up her bag and placed it on her lap. She was thankful that another woman had chosen to sit next to her. Spending the ride so close to a man might have given her anxiety. Thank you, the woman said as she sat. 
I have not traveled by train before, and I must admit I am a little nervous. Me too. Kate offered her seatmate a small smile. Oh, wonderful. Then we can try it out together, the woman said. I only wish I were traveling under different circumstances. Oh? Kate didn't want to pry, but the woman had brought it up. Yes, unfortunately I am heading out west due to a death in my family. Well, two, actually. My husband passed away a month ago, and after my granddaughter was killed in a bank robbery, I decided to move out west to be close to the only family I have left. Kate's eyes widened and her hand shot to her mouth. I am so sorry for your loss. Me too, the woman said. Charles was older and had lived a full life, but Pauline was so young, only 20 years of age and about to be married. Oh, that's awful, Kate murmured. She felt bad for her seatmate and for the poor woman's family, but she was also more worried about her own safety now. Kate had known the West might be dangerous, but she had never thought about bank robberies. I am sorry for going on, the woman said. You did not ask for my sad story. My name is Ellen, by the way. What is your name, dear? Kate. Well, Mary Catherine would be, but I go by Kate. Ellen smiled at her. Nice to meet you, Kate. What are you heading west for? I am heading west to get married, Kate said softly, and then bit her lip. Normally, marriage was a happy occasion, but she felt bad discussing hers with this woman, as her granddaughter had been about to marry. Ellen appeared to take no offense to this statement. That is wonderful, dear. I know I enjoyed my years with Charles. I wish you the best of luck. As the train chugged westward, the two women continued to chat and share their stories. Kate was glad to have made a friend, even if it was only until they reached Texas. Jesse sat in the far corner of the saloon that night, nursing a beer. He rarely drank and never frequented the saloon. But since losing Pauline, he felt lost. The patrol today had been uneventful. And while Jesse was glad to not have more violence, he could not help feeling the need to be doing something more to avenge Pauline. Sorry about your loss, hon. Jesse looked up to see a buxom blonde standing over his table. Her bright red corset was cinched tight with black laces to create the illusion of a thinner waist. But all it did was send extra skin spilling over the top. Jesse dropped his eyes. These scantily clad women were only one reason he had generally avoided saloons. Thank you, he mumbled into his mug. I could help you forget your pain, she said in a suggestive voice as her hand touched his arm. Jesse flung her arm away and stood up. Don't touch me. The room tilted and spun as he tried to focus. Somewhere in the midst of the swaying, he saw the girl cower back before the long-haired owner rushed to her side. What's the problem, Lizzie? The owner growled. Clad entirely in black with dark eyes and a scar on his cheek, the man was a fearsome sight even when he wasn't angry. But when irritated, his face grew red and mottled, reminding Jesse of a bull about to charge. The normally noisy establishment was now silent, watching the scene unfold, and undoubtedly waiting for a fight to break out. Though Jesse had never participated, he had often heard the men of the town talk about the entertainment of fights at the saloon. It was my fault, Wyatt, the woman said. Though still quiet, her voice held a firm resolve. He just lost his fiancé, and I pushed him when I shouldn't have. Wyatt turned to Jessie, who was leaning against the wall, trying to keep from getting sick. The interior of his stomach sloshed like a boat tossed around in a storm. 
Alcohol was another reason he didn't frequent saloons. He never had learned to like the taste, and he hated what it did to his stomach. I think it is time you left for tonight, Wyatt said. I don't like my ladies getting upset. I was just leaving anyway, Jesse slurred. He pulled a few coins from his pocket and tossed them on the table before staggering out of the saloon. He should never have been in there, not as a Christian, and not now that he was a deputy. It did not create the type of image he wanted to portray. But with Pauline gone, his life was suddenly upside down, and he no longer knew which way was up. Even worse, he wasn't sure that he cared. He had almost made it to his horse when something caught his foot and he stumbled, falling onto the dusty ground. For a minute, he thought about simply laying his head down and sleeping off his stupor there. But before he could, a hand appeared in front of his face. Jesse raised his eyes to see Pastor Lewis staring down at him. I was hoping to find you, Jesse, the pastor said. His soft, kind voice usually uplifted Jesse's spirits. But tonight, Jesse didn't want pity. He just wanted the pain to stop. Why, pastor? Why did he take her? The pastor took Jesse's hand and helped him stand. We can't always see God's plan, but he has one, Jesse, and we have to trust that good will come even in the midst of our trials. I don't know what good can come from Pauline's death. Pastor Lewis placed Jesse's arm around his shoulder and supported the man with his other arm. Why don't you come with me, and we will sober you up and discuss it. Chapter 6 Kate rubbed her eyes as the sunlight streamed through the window opposite her. She wanted to roll over and fall back to sleep, but every part of her body ached from the hard wooden bed. Good morning, Kate. How did you sleep? Ah, uh, yes. Ellen was the inconsiderate neighbor who had lifted her shade at whatever ungodly hour it was. Not as well as I'd hoped, Kate said, pushing herself into a seated position. How do people travel on these things for days on end? I need a decent bed and a washing in the worst way. Ellen smiled. I suppose when you have lived as long as I have, you will have slept on a myriad of beds, some more comfortable than others. I find I can sleep almost anywhere now because of it. Did you move often? Kate asked. She had only ever lived in the house with her parents, and then the house with Robert, and both had been of adequate standards. They might not have been rich but they had actual beds and wash basins that were filled daily. Well, I was originally born in England. We moved to the United States when I was about 25. Unfortunately, my husband had a hard time finding work, and we were forced to move a few times until he could find a steady job. I didn't mind it as much, but my daughter never adjusted to the multiple moves. And when she was old enough, she moved west with her husband in hopes of finding a permanent home. I have only been out there once before, but she seemed happy. I thought you said this was your first time on a train, Kate said, confused. Ellen laughed and sat next to Kate. That is true. The last time I went, I had to make the whole journey by stagecoach. It was a long and dusty journey, and I much prefer the train. How long did it take by stagecoach? Kate asked. Weeks, Ellen said with a shake of her head and a nostalgic smile. And while I'll still have to take a stagecoach to get to Sage Creek, it will be a much shorter journey this time. I do believe there is a wash basin on board this train if you would like to venture with me to find it. I would love that, Kate said as she touched her hair. 
It was no longer in the position she had placed it yesterday before leaving, and she felt grimy. While she was not sure she could fix her hair without a proper mirror, she could at least wash the dirt from her face and hands. As the other passengers in the sleeping car began to stir, the two women made their way down the aisle in search of a place to clean up. Jesse stood a respectful distance from the gravesite, though he wanted to be up front. After all, Pauline had nearly been his wife. James had made it abundantly clear that Jesse was neither wanted nor welcome up front with the family. And so he stood with his hat in his hands at the back, feeling very much like an outsider. Pauline's life was taken far too early, Pastor Lewis said from the front. But we have to remember that God has a plan for everything. We often do not know why things happen, but he does. Remember that he knows of every hair on your head, and he has a purpose for everything he allows to happen. That does not mean we cannot mourn Pauline, for she was a dear sister, daughter, and friend to all of us. But we know that she is in a better place with no suffering and pain. For that we can rejoice. He paused and looked out over the small crowd gathered. Is there anyone who would like to say a word on Pauline's behalf or share a story from memory? Jesse wanted to barge his way to the front. He had so many memories of Pauline. The way she smiled at him when he entered a room. The way her laugh sounded musical like the bells they sometimes played in church at Christmas or the way her hand felt like the finest silk. But no one wanted to hear these memories. And if he were honest, Jesse didn't want to share these memories with the people here either. He wanted to tuck them inside and hold them close to his heart. When Rebecca, Pauline's childhood friend, stepped forward, Jesse knew it was time for him to go. There was nothing more he could do here, and listening to other people's memories of Pauline wouldn't fill the hole in his heart. Glad for once he was at the back, Jesse slipped quietly away from the gravesite. He had tied Molly up to a tree out of sight, and he headed that direction. She was happily munching on some grass when he approached, blissfully unaware of the sadness around her. As he rode back to his homestead, Jesse wondered about his future. Of course, he would do nothing until he avenged her death. But after that, what? He had stayed in Sage Creek for Pauline. With her gone, should he pull up roots and find a new home? Kate was especially glad she had made a friend in Ellen when the train pulled into the final station and they were forced to switch to the stagecoach. Though it was her first time as well, Ellen seemed to know what to do and whom to talk to in order to make sure their trunks were pulled off the train and loaded onto the correct stagecoach. It made Kate wonder if there were some books she should have read before making the trip. How do you know how to do all of this? Kate asked as her curiosity got the better of her. Ellen laughed as she gathered her bag. I asked a friend who made a trip a few months ago. I figured the process could not have changed that much in that short amount of time. Although it feels like technology is changing every day. One day, I believe we will have some form of transportation even faster than a train. That would be something. Kate agreed. Though I cannot see how it would work. Even trains are expensive. How would we ever afford something faster? Well, that is what I said about trains before they became more prevalent. But look at me now. Kate nodded and followed Ellen off the train and to the platform where their trunks had been unloaded. Where would you ladies like these taken? The porter asked them. You can place them over at the stagecoach office, Ellen said pointing to a smaller building off to the left that had a similar platform to the train station. Yes, ma'am, the man said, and began hefting their trunks toward the building. 
Shall we check in? Ellen asked. Kate nodded, but her attention was focused on the town around her. It was very different from Boston. The town seemed painted in a single hue of brown. There were few trees to add any color, and while there were buildings, they were all single stories, whereas some of the buildings back home were several stories tall. Kate, are you coming? Ellen asked, placing a black-gloved hand on Kate's arm. Oh, yes, sorry, Kate stammered. I was just struck by how different it is here. She followed Ellen to the stagecoach office where Ellen purchased her ticket and Kate redeemed the pass she had been sent. Well, it looks like we have a few minutes before the coach arrives, Ellen said. Would you like to look around? Kate nodded. Her body was not used to being in an enclosed space for such a long time. And she longed to stretch the kinks out of her legs. The women continued up the main street, passing the general store, the clinic, and the saloon before turning around. By the time they reached the stagecoach office again, the stagecoach was just pulling up. Perfect timing, Ellen said with a smile. Now we just have a few more hours on the road. Kate sighed at the thought. The train hadn't been extremely comfortable, but at least they had been able to stand up and move around. The stagecoach would have no such amenities. You ladies have your tickets? The driver of the stagecoach asked as they approached. Yes, sir, Ellen said and handed over her ticket. Kate followed suit. All right, he said after looking them over. Do you have any other baggage? Yes, those trunks. Ellen pointed to the trunks sitting against the wall of the stagecoach office. The driver nodded. That's fine. I'll load them up. My name is Thomas. I'm going to check and see if we have any more passengers or a shotgun messenger. We don't often ride without one. Does that mean we could be stuck here? Kate asked as Thomas stepped into the stagecoach office. She had a little extra money, but she hadn't planned on having to stay at many inns along the way. I don't know, but I'm sure they'll work it out. Ellen tried to sound brave, but Kate didn't miss the uncertainty in her voice or the look of concern that crossed her face. Thomas re-emerged from the office with one stern woman and one mousy man following him. The man was continually pushing spectacles up the bridge of his nose. Kate hoped he wasn't their shotgun messenger, as she wasn't sure he could hit the broad side of a barn. Are we not still missing one person? Kate asked. No, it turns out we won't have a shotgun messenger on this trip, as we aren't carrying a strongbox. Kate wasn't sure whether that made her feel better or worse. With no strong box, hopefully they wouldn't be a target for robbers, but the extra protection of the shotgun rider would have been nice. All right, everyone, I will load up this last baggage and we'll get on our way. Norman, help him out, why don't you? The stern-faced woman said to the mousy man. It looks like he has it, love. And besides, my back, you know? He pushed the spectacles up again as he spoke. The woman rolled her eyes. Well, then help me inside. Yes, love, the man said. He opened the coach door and held out his hand for the woman to help her up. Then he scrambled up behind her. Ellen raised her eyebrows at Kate, who was forced to cover her mouth to keep from giggling. All ready, ladies? Thomas asked as he approached them. Yes, thank you, Ellen said, as she took his hand and climbed in the stagecoach. Kate followed suit, and then the door closed behind her. The interior of the coach surprised Kate. It was covered in a dark plush fabric and could seat four people comfortably. The stern woman and Norman had taken the far seat so Kate sat next to Ellen. This is not that bad, Kate began, 
But her words were cut short when the coach lurched forward and she was thrown back against the seat. You were saying? Ellen asked, her lips pulling up into a grin. Kate shook her head. That should teach me to speak too soon. I abhor these contraptions, the woman said. But they are slightly better than traveling by horseback. Thankfully, we don't have far to go, love, the man said. We're going to Belleville to visit my sister, he added for Ellen and Kate. I don't see why she couldn't just come to us, the woman harumphed. Kate and Ellen shared another smirking glance, and then the ride evened out. Kate became accustomed to the rhythm of the swaying coach. Though occasionally bumpy, the ride itself wasn't much worse than the train. However, the plume of dirt that resided out their window made it nearly impossible to see the passing scenery. While the accommodations are not that bad, Kate said, I cannot imagine making the entire trip from Boston this way. Ellen smiled and nodded. Yes, it was quite a long trip, to be sure. I much prefer the train, where at least there is a privy and a place to clean up. I much prefer not to take such trips at all, the woman said. The conversation halted after that, and Kate's mind turned to her future. She wasn't sure how much time had passed when the coach stopped suddenly. Kate looked to Ellen. Are we there already? That seemed awfully fast. Ellen's eyes were wide as she shook her head and placed a finger to her lips in a shushing motion. There was a commotion outside, and then the door of the coach opened. Ellen and the stern woman gasped, as it was not the friendly face of their driver. The face of the man was covered by a red cloth. Only his eyes were visible, and they were a clear blue and as cold as ice. Hey, boss, we got a group of women in here, the man said. I am not a woman, Norman began, but the woman elbowed him and he shut his mouth. Not in time, though, as he drew attention from the robber at the door. Correction, three women and one man. Bring them out and make sure they grab all of their things, a voice hollered back. You heard the boss the masked man said. Grab your things and get on out. Kate wanted to refuse, but the gun the man brandished as he motioned them to get out kept her mouth shut. Grabbing her bag, she stood and stepped down from the coach. Kate bit her lips together as she spied the driver face down in the dirt. She thought she could just barely make out the rise and fall of his chest but she worried how they would continue without a driver. Don't worry, he'll be fine as long as he stays down. As Kate looked up at the man on the horse who had spoken, he pulled his black hat even lower on his eyes. A similar cloth covered his face, and the only defining characteristic Kate could identify was the sling over his right shoulder. He appeared to have been injured recently. Ellen climbed down beside Kate, and the two women clasped hands. The stern woman and Norman followed Ellen and stood on the other side of the door. Those bags all you have? the man on horseback asked. As he gestured at the traveling bags clutched in their hands. Kate knew he could see their trunks from his vantage point on the steed, and guessed he was testing them. We each have a trunk she said, pulling her shoulders back to present a brave front. You're a smart girl, the man said, and though Kate couldn't see his face, she would have sworn he was smiling. Mine holds mainly my clothes, she said, nothing of value. I didn't ask you what they held, girl. The man's voice had turned into a snarl. Whether there is value in them or not is for us to determine. Their trunks thudded to the ground, followed by a third masked robber. The woman moaned as one trunk popped open and spilled its contents across the ground. Norman shushed her and pulled her closer to his side. 
relieve them of their bags, the man on horseback ordered, and the first man snatched their bags from their hands. He loaded up the saddlebags on one horse. Get those other trunks open, the leader said to the third man, and let's see what's in there. The man on the ground obeyed and rifled through the couple's trunk that had opened on impact. He held up a wad of money before shoving it in a pouch and turning to Ellen's trunk. Dresses and jewelry went flying out of her trunk as he opened the lid and knocked it over. The robber snatched up her jewelry, shoving it in a pouch, and flung the rest of the clothes to the side. Kate felt Ellen stiffen beside her and a glance out of the corner of her eye showed the older woman biting her lip. Kate's trunk fared no better fate. He flipped the lid open, and Kate cringed when he grabbed her mother's brooch and shoved it into the pouch. She watched, helpless, as her other jewelry was added to his stash. But she could hold her tongue no longer when he held up her wedding dress. Please, Kate said. Please let me keep my dress. I'm betrothed and supposed to be meeting my husband in Lisbon. Please do not make me get married in this. Kate motioned at the traveling dress she wore. The man on horseback walked his horse over until he was directly in front of Kate. Married, huh? She tried to keep her eyes on his to pretend she wasn't afraid of him, but his harsh gaze penetrated her thin wall of bravery and she dropped her eyes. They landed on his left hand, which was holding the reins of his horse. A white scar in the shape of a crescent moon resided there. Though she was not sure what she would do with the information, she committed the image to memory. Well, I certainly wouldn't want you wearing rags to your wedding. The man laughed as he turned his horse away. Let's ride, boys. The men on the ground mounted their steeds after grabbing the remaining jewelry and money from Kate's trunk and the couple's trunk. As they rode out of sight, Kate hurried to the driver on the ground. There was a gash across his head, but it appeared shallow, more likely from the butt of the gun than anything else. With the tip of her skirt, she wiped the blood away. I think he'll be okay, she said, turning to Ellen. Ellen, however, was curled into a ball. Her arms were wrapped around her knees and she was rocking back and forth. As Kate hurried over, she noticed the other woman had fainted and Norman was fanning her face. Kate wrapped her arm around Ellen. It will be all right. It was only things. It was everything I had, the older woman murmured. We'll figure something out, Kate said although she also wondered how she was going to pay for any other incidentals. The woman woke first, but her stern words were gone, and she was content to let Norman stroke her hand. Kate picked up the contents of the trunks while they waited for Thomas to stir. The sun had shifted considerably in the sky when Thomas finally felt able to continue the journey. Though none of them felt comfortable continuing on, They feared for their safety even more if they stayed put, especially with evening approaching. After reloading the coach, Thomas helped the four subdued passengers back inside. How far are we from Sage Creek? Kate asked Thomas before he closed the door. Another few hours. We're about an hour out of Belleville. Let's stop and talk to the sheriff there in case the robbers come after the town. Do you think they would telegraph Sage Creek and Lisbon and let them know of our delay? Yes, ma'am, he nodded. I'm sure they will. With that, he closed the door, and Kate settled back against the seat. How is it you appear so calm about all this? Ellen asked, as the coach lurched forward again. Kate bit the inside of her lip as she thought about how to answer. I wouldn't say that I'm calm. I'm as angry as a hornet and worried how I'm going to make it with no money. But I guess the difference is that I know Jesus is looking out for me. Even when I'm worried, he has a plan, so I'm trying to leave it in his hands. It's not like worrying helps solve the problem anyway. 
Ellen sat back and regarded Kate. I've never been one much for religion, but I think I'd like to hear more about this Jesus of yours. Kate glanced over at the other couple, but when they didn't protest, she smiled and told Ellen of Jesus' love. Chapter 7 Jesse sighed as he led Molly towards the stagecoach platform. The sun was setting, and he wanted to be home in bed, concocting scenarios of revenge. But the telegraph of a stagecoach being robbed had come in a few hours ago. Being the new deputy and the only one without family, nothing like rubbing salt in the wound. He'd been given the task of meeting the stagecoach and taking accounts from the passengers. He stiffened as he saw three people on the platform. Was he late? No, as he grew closer, he recognized the tall physique of James and the smaller outlines of Pauline's parents. What were they doing here? It wasn't as if he were avoiding them. But they served as a reminder of Pauline's death. Go home, Jesse, James said. We don't need you here. Jesse matched James's cool tone. I'm here on sheriff business, James. It's my understanding this stagecoach was robbed, and I am here to collect the details of the encounter in order to begin an investigation. Oh, now you care about the robbers, James said snidely. Too bad you couldn't care a few days before Pauline was killed. Jesse took a deep breath to remain calm. What are you doing out this late? Is there something I can help with? We are here for the stagecoach, James spat. My grandmother is on that stagecoach. Even though she's older and missed Pauline's funeral, she's making the trip over from the East Coast. The words stung Jesse, and he narrowed his eyes at the man who was almost his brother-in-law. He had loved Pauline, and yet James was acting as if it had been Jesse's bullet that had killed her. Even if Jesse had been deputized on the day of the robbery, there was no guarantee the result would have been any different. He opened his mouth to say as much, but the look of sadness on Pauline's parents' face kept him from it. There was no need to deepen their pain to satisfy his ego. Moments later, the sound of the approaching stage drew Jesse's attention. He sat straighter in his saddle keeping his eyes peeled for any shadiness. But he figured the robbers would not be stupid enough to rob the same stage twice. The stagecoach came to a stop in front of the station, and the driver jumped down to open the door. A nasty bruise covered his forehead, but he appeared in decent shape otherwise. Jesse noticed there was no shotgun messenger. He would have to remember to ask if they had started with one. When the coach door opened, an older woman with gray hair stepped down first, followed by a younger woman with dark locks. Mother! Pauline's mother croaked out through tears as she ran into the older woman's arms. Where is your sheriff? The younger woman asked, her eyes glancing around. When they landed on Jesse, his breath caught. They were the bluest eyes he had ever seen. We need to discuss the robbery to which we were subjected. I am a deputy sheriff, miss, Jesse said, removing his hat as he spoke. I'm Deputy Jennings, and I'll be taking that account down for you. Good. The young woman nodded at him and turned to the driver. Thomas, would you be opposed to a brief layover before we continue to Lisbon? No, miss. I could use some rest, too, and it's dangerous to travel at night. We should wait and head out in the morning. For the first time since the woman stepped off the coach, she appeared flustered. But I have no money and no place to stay. You'll stay with us, the older woman said, reaching out a hand to the younger woman. Oh, Ellen, I could not impose, the younger began. Nonsense. Ellen responded. You kept your head when the attack happened and calmed me afterwards. 
It is only one night, but I will not hear of you staying anywhere but with us. Right, Iris? Sure, yes, Iris stammered. If you helped my mother, then our house is open to you. Jesse stifled his sigh of irritation. He wanted to finish his duty and return home. How about the three of you come with me then? I'll take your statements and you ladies can be on your way. Thomas, was it? He asked, turning to the driver. We'll get you set up with a room at the inn. I don't think I'll be of much help, Ellen said. I was too scared to take much notice. I just remember there were three men. I'm sure my statement will be enough, the younger woman said. Why don't you spend some time with your family, Ellen, and I'll get this nice deputy to drop me off afterwards. That won't be a problem, will it? Though she formed the words as a question, the tone behind them was more of a command. Jesse opened his mouth to say no, but the woman batted her eyes at him and smiled ever so sweetly. Before he could utter the word, he found his head nodding against his will in response. It will be no problem, miss. He trailed off as he realized he hadn't heard her name as of yet. Whidbey. Mary Catherine Whidbey. James, be a good boy and grab our trunks, will you? Ellen asked sweetly, before turning her attention to Jessie. You do know where to take her after she's done giving her account, don't you? Mother, Iris hissed, glancing sharply at Jessie. This is Jessie Jennings, the man Pauline was going to marry. Ellen's eyes grew round and her hand flew to her mouth. Oh dear, I am so sorry. I should have realized from the name. I guess I'm still flustered from the robbery. It's all right, ma'am, Jesse said, swallowing the knot of emotion trying to climb up his throat. But to answer your question, I do know where to take Miss Whidbey. Ellen stared at him a moment longer, then nodded. We'll see you soon, Kate she said, turning her attention to the younger woman. As Pauline's family loaded up their wagon, Jessie threw Molly's reins around a nearby post. If you two will come with me, the sheriff's office is just up the way. Though Jessie led the way, he noticed that Miss Whidbey stayed almost even with him in stride. Who was this woman and where had she come from? After unlocking the door, Jessie pointed to the two chairs in the room and grabbed some paper and a pencil from the desk. He leaned against the edge as he looked from the woman to the driver. Let's start with you, Thomas. Can you tell me what you remember? The man nodded. We were traveling the path to Belleville when I came across a fallen tree. When I slowed the coach down, a man came out from behind one of the trees with a gun pointed on me. Before I could reach for my gun, two more appeared on horses. I guess one of them hit me with his gun, because the next thing I remember is waking up to Miss Whidbey's face. The man shot an admiring glance at the woman, who smiled but didn't appear to reciprocate the feelings. Did you not have a shotgun messenger? Jesse asked. No, we weren't carrying a strongbox, so they sent us on without one. I don't know why they targeted us. Thomas answered. Jesse shook his head, unsure himself. Perhaps they were hoping for wealthy passengers, or perhaps they were just desperate. How about you, Miss Whidbey? What do you remember? The woman drew herself straighter in the chair. The coach stopped, and we heard a commotion. One of the men opened the door and ordered us outside. He wore a red cloth over his face, so all I remember were his eyes. They were blue and cold. Once outside, we saw another man on horseback. He also wore a mask and his hat low, so I couldn't see any of his face. But his right shoulder was in a sling as if he'd been injured recently. Jesse stopped scribbling and looked up at the woman. Could it have been from a gunshot? Miss Whidbey shook her head. I can't say for sure. I don't remember blood on his arm but I suppose it could have been from a gunshot. Why do you ask? Jesse tapped the pencil against the pad of paper. Could it be the same band of robbers? Nothing. Keep going, please. 
A third man came around the side of the coach, and the two on the ground took our bags, dumped our trunks, and stole our money and jewelry. Oddly, the man on horseback allowed me to keep my wedding dress. Wedding dress? Jesse asked. Yes, I'm supposed to be meeting my husband in Lisbon. Jesse realized he was staring at her and forced his eyes back to the paper. All right, is there anything else you remember that you can tell me? Miss Whidbey closed her eyes for a moment, as if mentally recalling the incident. Then her lids snapped open. Yes, there was one more thing. The man on horseback had a scar on his hand. Jessie's throat went dry. A scar, did you say? What type of scar? Her brow furrowed. A small white one, like the sliver of a moon. Rage boiled within Jesse, and he nearly snapped the pencil in two. Where were you when you were attacked? He asked the driver. About an hour east of Belleville, the man said. We dropped two passengers off there and spoke with their deputy, who told us the robbers had hit them too. This band was getting more dangerous every day. Three attacks in less than three days? The sheriff might be content to sit and wait for them to come back, but Jesse was beginning to feel more strongly that they would have to go after the men to get them to stop. Thank you both for your accounts, Jesse said, placing the paper and pencil back on the desk. Thomas, let's get you settled in the inn, and then I'll take you to the Masterson's, Miss Whidbey. Jesse led the way out and locked the office behind him. The inn is run by Clark and Martha Davis, Jesse said. I think you will find them quite accommodating. As long as it's a place to sleep, I'll be fine, Thomas answered. The inn door was closed when they arrived, but after a few hard raps at the door, light shone out of the window. A short, older woman with gray hair and kind eyes answered the door. Hi, Martha. Jesse said. I'm sorry to bother you so late, but Thomas here is a stagecoach driver. They were robbed earlier today. He has no money to pay you, but he needs a place to stay. Martha nodded and ushered Thomas inside. Of course I will find him a place to stay. Do you need a place too, miss? She asked, turning her attention to Miss Whidbey. No, thank you. I'm staying with Ellen Baker. She's staying with the Mastersons, Martha. Jesse said, trying to squash the emotion threatening his voice. But thank you. Martha's eyes widened, and she nodded knowingly. All right, well, you have a good night, deputy. Jesse nodded and tipped his hat in her direction. Well, Miss Whidbey, I have no wagon. Will you be opposed to riding on my horse? Of course not, Miss Whidbey said with narrowed eyes. I am an accomplished rider. I meant no offense, miss, Jesse said. Though he would never say so out loud, he admired the woman's spunk. I was more concerned with your comfort because of the forced proximity between us on horseback. Oh, Miss Whidbey dropped her eyes. Thank you for your concern, but as there is no other option, it will be fine. When they reached Molly, Jesse helped Miss Whidbey onto the saddle first before swinging up behind her. Though he tried to keep as much distance between them as possible, he couldn't help smelling the intoxicating sweet scent wafting his way. She turned slightly in the saddle so she could see him and asked, Ellen's granddaughter was your fiancé? Jesse looked away as he nodded. Her name was Pauline, and yes, she was. The woman opened her mouth as if to ask another question, but his cold gaze must have changed her mind as she shut it and turned forward again. The rest of the trip to the Masterson residence occurred in silence. He pulled Molly to a stop, dismounted, and reached a hand up to help Miss Whidbey down. When her feet hit the ground, she looked up at him and said, I'm sorry about your fiancé. I hope you find the men who did this. Thank you for the ride. Before he could respond, she turned on her heels and walked away. Jessie waited until she was safely in the residence before mounting Molly and steering her towards home. Her last statement rattled around in his head. 
Would he ever find Pauline's killers and be able to avenge her death? Chapter 8 Kate swallowed her fear as she hugged Ellen goodbye on the platform. Though she knew she needed to get to Lisbon, a large part of her was afraid to step in the coach. What if the robbers struck again? Or worse yet, what if an entirely different band of robbers struck? How far is it to Lisbon again? She asked Thomas as he loaded her now much lighter trunk. It's about an hour, miss. It will be fine. Ellen placed a reassuring hand on Kate's arm. You've told Deputy Jennings the story. Kate glanced over at the stony-faced man on horseback near the coach. Evidently, he would be escorting them out of town. I'm not sure what good it did. Ellen followed Kate's gaze. I know he seems stoic now, and I never met him before, but I knew Pauline, and she would not have settled for anything other than a great man. All set, miss, Thomas said from the front of the coach. I guess that's my cue. Kate sighed softly. She hugged Ellen again before climbing into the coach once more. Thomas shut the door and Kate waved out the window. When the buildings faded away and the sagebrush took over the view, Kate sat back and thought about her future. She found herself wondering what her husband would be like. Would he be tall with broad shoulders? Would he have a beard? Would he have kind brown eyes? Roughly an hour later, the coach stopped and the door opened. Welcome to Lisbon, miss. Thomas held out his hand for her to step down. Kate glanced around as she took Thomas's hand. Lisbon didn't appear much different from Sage Creek. As the platform was empty, Kate wondered how she was supposed to get in touch with her future husband, Bill Easterly. Before she had time to worry, a wagon pulled up, and a man who appeared about 30 climbed down. He had average brown hair and eyes, which narrowed slightly at her before he pasted a smile on his face. You must be Miss Whidby. I'm so sorry I'm late. I'm Bill Easterly. He held out his gloved right hand to take hers, though Kate noticed he grimaced slightly at the movement. Kate wondered if he was not pleased with her appearance. She had tried to smooth the wrinkles in her dress the best she could. With a tight smile, she placed her hand in his and nodded. Kate Whidbey, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Easterly. She had hoped to feel sparks or some sort of attraction with this man, but there was nothing. Did this mean she was in store for a loveless marriage? Oh, please call me Bill. After all, we'll be getting married shortly, won't we? Something in the way he said the words sent a shiver down Kate's spine. What had she gotten herself into? Do you have much luggage? He continued. Just this trunk. She pointed to the large chest Thomas had gotten down for her. I would have had a little more, but we were robbed on the way here. Oh, that's awful. Were you harmed? He was saying the right words, but there was still something about him that bothered Kate. No, thank goodness. They took my jewelry, but I did manage to convince them to let me keep my wedding dress. Well, that is all that matters. He began to move her trunk into his wagon. Jewelry wouldn't do you much good on the homestead anyway. Though he tried to hide it, Kate heard a small grunt as he lifted her trunk and noticed he wasn't lifting the right side as high as the left. Did you injure your shoulder? Kate asked. Bill turned toward her, a hardness in his eyes. Why would you ask that? Kate flinched at the icy tone of his voice, but she tried to keep her voice from shaking as she responded. You appear to be having some trouble lifting with your right side. His gaze softened and he smiled. Oh yeah, I hurt my shoulder roping some cattle the other day. 
I reckon it's still a little sore. It's nothing to worry about, though. Kate nodded. I'll pray for a speedy recovery for you. Well, that'd be mighty nice of you. You ready? He held out his left hand to her this time. Though some intuition told her she should not get in the wagon with him, she had no excuse to offer, and she had made a promise. But she would be vigilant and keep her eyes open until she said, I do. When the wagon headed out of town, Kate turned to Bill. Aren't we heading to the preacher? I thought you might like to see the farm first and get changed there, Bill said, flashing her a smile. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Kate said. It would be nice to see the place she would be calling home from now on. So you said you were robbed. Bill glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. Did you get a good look at them? Kate had no idea why, but her inclination was to withhold the truth from him. No, she shook her head, hoping her voice wouldn't give her away. I was too scared to notice much, and they wore masks. I only know that there were three of them. Ah, well, that's too bad, he said. That isn't much to give authorities. No, it isn't, Kate agreed. I doubt I shall ever see my things again. Most of it doesn't matter to me, but I do wish they hadn't taken my mother's brooch. It was important to you? he asked. It was one of the last things I had of my mother's. She died a few months ago. Oh, that's too bad. But such is the nature of life, I suppose, Bill said. I suppose. Kate was slightly shocked at his blasé dismissal of her mother's death. And another nugget of unease bloomed within her. She was not the best at directions, but she tried to memorize the way out to Bill's ranch in case she needed to find her way back to town on her own. Well, there it is. Bill lifted his arm slightly to point. The landscape dipped and allowed Kate to see a small ranch house. A horse was corralled on one side, and on the other side, a small creek ran by the house. Though this part of Texas didn't have many trees, Bill seemed to have several on his land. It isn't much, I know, but I'm planning to expand soon. I'm sure it's lovely. This time, the smile Bill flashed her was sincere, and Kate almost forgot her misgivings. Almost. He stopped the wagon in front of the house moments later and helped her down. Would you mind if we just got your dress from the trunk? Bill asked. My shoulder is aching a bit, and I'm not sure I could carry it inside at the moment. No, that's fine. I can take out what I need. Kate walked around to the back of the wagon and opened her trunk. Kate moved the other dresses aside until she found her mother's wedding dress at the bottom. It was a cream silk, which had recently become popular when her mother married and though it had a round skirt rather than the now fashionable bustle and fishtail, Kate had always loved it. The neckline scooped just low enough to show off her collarbones, and tiny rosettes lined the neck and sleeves. Kate removed the dress, careful not to pull too hard, and then grabbed the matching gloves. The shoes didn't match exactly, but as Kate's feet were two sizes larger than her mother's had been, she had needed to supply her own shoes. She also grabbed her coat. Though it wasn't cold enough to need it, she still didn't want her groom to see her in her wedding dress before the ceremony. And as they had to drive back to town, that would be nearly impossible unless she were covered up. All right, I'm ready, she said. Wonderful. Follow me and I'll show you your room. Bill led the way into the house. The front door opened into a small main room. Kate imagined it could look a little homier with a handmade quilt. The kitchen was to the left, which appeared to have an older stove. Perhaps they could purchase some new cookware and utensils. There was a door at the back of the main room, which Kate assumed led to his quarters. 
Bill opened the door and held it open for her. It held a single bed and a small chest for her to put her clothes in. I'll leave you to get changed and I'll freshen up myself, he said. I rescheduled the wedding for dusk today when I received word your stagecoach was delayed. Kate nodded and waited for him to shut the door before collapsing on the bed. The quilt covering it was tattered and threadbare. Nothing about this room seemed to show he cared about his future bride, deepening Kate's apprehension. Perhaps her brother had been right. What had she been thinking when she agreed to marry a complete stranger? Kate sent up a prayer for wisdom as she changed out of her traveling dress and into her mother's wedding dress. The dress still fit as perfectly as it had a year ago, when she had snuck into her mother's closet and tried it on. But wearing it now didn't hold the joy she had always believed it would. Was that because she didn't want to be married, or because she might be marrying the wrong man? She sighed and pushed the thought from her mind as she pulled on the gloves and slipped her feet inside her shoes. Then she folded her traveling dress and draped the coat about her shoulders. There was no looking glass in this room, so Kate was unable to check her appearance. But she tucked her hair back into place as best she could and pinched her cheeks to add some color before exiting the room. Bill was sitting in the main room, and he let out a whistle as she entered. My, my, aren't you a sight? The words should have brought a smile to Kate's face, but instead they caused the hairs on her arms to stand on end. He did not give her the lecherous look that Mr. Tanner had often given her, but his tone gave her the same feeling. Time's a-wastin'. He stood and brushed his hands down his pants. Let's head back into town so I can make you my wife. Kate noticed he was still wearing gloves as he held out his arm to her. Had he injured his hands in his accident as well, or were they deformed in some way? She took his arm and followed him out to the wagon, where he again helped her up before climbing up beside her. The ride back to town was quiet as Kate's mind was on her future, and she had no idea what Bill was thinking. The church was a small clapboard building with a single steeple, which housed a bell. Though probably a bright white at one time, the paint was now faded and peeling, giving the church a dilapidated appearance. Kate wondered if anyone had any pride for this church. Bill helped her down and led her inside. Rows of wooden pews lined either side of the aisle, and a single reed organ sat at the front of the church, under a stained glass window. Welcome, a voice said from the front. I'm Pastor Jacob. A short man clad all in black stepped out from behind the pulpit at the front. Pastor, it's Bill Easterly. I've come with Kate Whidbey for you to marry us, Bill said. To Kate, he whispered, Pastor Jacob has trouble remembering things from time to time. Oh, yes, Bill, the preacher said. I've been expecting you. Do you have the rings? I do. Bill patted his pocket. Wonderful, Pastor Jacob said. If you are both ready, please remove your coats and gloves. Kate removed her coat and gloves and laid them on the pew in the first row. Bill hesitated, but removed his gloves as well. Please join hands, Pastor Jacob instructed, waving his hands in a motion to get them to step closer together. After another small hesitation, Bill held out his hands to Kate. It was only a momentary flash as he quickly turned them palm up, but it was long enough for her to see the white puckered skin on his left hand. Her eyes widened slightly and her heart thundered in her ears, but she forced herself to remain calm. What nightmare was she living in? This man wasn't just creepy. He was the robber. There was no way she could go through with this marriage. But how was she going to get away without arousing his suspicion? Do you have any guests? 
Pastor Jacob asked, moving from side to side and scanning the church. No, it's just us. Can we get on with the ceremony? There was a note of impatience in his voice and a stiffness to his posture as if he was about to bolt. I suppose, but it will change my wording. It's hard to say, dearly beloved, when there is no one out there. Perhaps this was her chance. I'm sorry. Kate brought her hand to her face and fanned it. I'm feeling rather faint. This was my mother's dress, and I think my corset is too tight. Is there a place where I might loosen it? Are you all right? Bill asked. I just need a moment. I'm sure I'll be fine. Kate hoped her face and tone did not betray her, and that the knocking of her knees was not as loud as it seemed in her ears. I just need to let the corset out a bit. My mother was a little smaller, I guess. You can use my study just through that door. Pastor Jacob pointed to a doorway behind him. Kate couldn't tell if there was an outside door attached to the room Pastor Jacob had pointed to, but she had no other choice. I'll be right back. She smiled sweetly at Bill, hoping she looked convincing. Kate hurried to the room, frowning slightly at the thought of leaving her coat, but there was no way she could grab it. The room held a small desk, and even more importantly, it had another doorway. As Kate put her hand on the handle, she prayed it led outside. The light had receded while she'd been inside and the air had cooled, but Kate didn't care. There was enough light from the moon to illuminate her path. She took off running to the right. As she rounded the church, she saw a horse tied up to a nearby post. While Kate didn't believe in stealing, this might be her only chance to escape. With one swift motion, she untied the reins and swung herself up onto the saddle. The wedding dress groaned in agony as it stretched in unexpected ways, and Kate found her airways slightly constricted. The corset wasn't too tight, but it was a tighter garment than she was used to riding in. She dug her heels into the horse, urging it into a run out of town. She was almost past the last building when the shot rang out. It wasn't near her, but she could hear yelling behind her. Kate hunkered as low as she could on the horse and rode on, praying Bill would not find a horse or get his own unhooked from the wagon in time. Chapter 9 Jesse had just finished feeding the livestock when a movement in the nearby brush caught his eye. Dropping his hand to the hilt of the revolver on his side, Jesse approached the brush. He expected a wild animal or perhaps an escaped calf, but he was unprepared for the tattered and dirty creature he found instead. Ms. Whidby? Her dark hair was a tangled, matted mess with stray grass and weeds sticking out of it. Her dress, once probably clean and beautiful, was now covered in dirt and ripped in several places. Scratches lined her arms and face, their angry red marks standing in steep contrast to her alabaster skin. Bill, she said softly, and her eyes fluttered open for just a moment. No, it's Jessie, Jessie Jennings, or... Deputy Jennings. When she didn't respond, Jessie leaned down and picked her up. Her head flopped against his shoulder, but even in her current disheveled state, he could still smell a soft, flowery scent. After a quick glance around to make sure no one was lying in ambush, Jessie hurried toward his house, barely feeling the weight of the woman in his arms. He kicked open the door, crossed to his bedroom, and laid her down on the bed. Unsure where to begin, Jesse grabbed a rag and dipped it in the wash basin. He wished he had someone he could send to fetch Doc Moore, but there was no one close. He would have to do what he could to patch her up and then load her up in his wagon when he was sure she could make the trip. He brought the wet cloth back to the bed and touched a red mark on her cheek. She elicited a slight moan, but her eyes remained closed. What had happened to her? 
And who was Bill? One at a time, he cleaned out the scratches and wiped the dirt off her face and arms. After three washings of the rag, he had cleaned off all the dirt and scratches he could see. With nothing else to do except wait for her to wake up, he covered her with a blanket, shut and locked the front door, and stretched out on the floor beside her. The sun had set completely when he awoke later to the sound of Miss Whidbey's voice. God, please don't let him find me. Please, Lord, protect me. She thrashed from side to side as if having a nightmare. Shh, Miss Whidbey. He placed a hand on her head in hopes of comforting her. You're having a bad dream, that's all. Her eyes snapped open. They were a deep blue, like he imagined the color of the ocean at its deepest point might be. For a moment, they were dazed, glancing from left to right as she took in the surroundings. Then they landed on him, and she scooted farther back on the bed. Deputy Jennings, where am I? How did I get here? I found you in the brush by my barn. Can you tell me what happened? Her eyes closed, and for a moment he thought she had fallen asleep again. I was looking for you. For me? Why? Her eyes opened. I found him. The robber. You found him? Anger surged through Jesse. Had he been the one to injure Miss Whidbey as well? Jesse wanted to tear out of the house and hunt the man down, but he needed a name, a description, something. Who is he? Jesse asked, but Miss Whidbey had passed out again. Jesse growled in frustration and fought the urge to shake her. Whatever she had gone through must have been terrible, and she needed her rest, but there would be no more rest for him not until she awoke again and could tell him what happened. Kate stirred as the first rays of morning light filtered in through the windows. Where, where am I? Kate struggled to sit up. Her head pounded and the room tilted in an unusual manner. Don't move too fast, a male voice said. Kate looked to the voice, surprised to see Deputy Jennings' face looking back at her. She pulled the blanket up to her chin and shied away from him. He held out his hand, and reluctantly Kate took it, allowing the deputy to help her sit up and lean against the headboard. As soon as the deputy released her hand, he stepped back as if her very presence was fire. He crossed his arms and met her gaze. Kate wondered if there ever had been warmth in his brown eyes. I found you on my property last night, and you were in pretty bad shape. Kate closed her eyes and shook her head slowly. I didn't know where you lived. I was just trying to get to Sage Creek to find you, because you were the only lawman I know. Yes, you said as much last night. You said you found him, the robber. A light seemed to enter him as he spoke of the robber. Yes, I found him, or rather he found me. Kate elicited a most unladylike snort. I almost married him. His name is Bill Easterly. At least, that's the name he gave me. He's a rancher in Lisbon. He lives that close? Kate blinked at the anger oozing from Deputy Jennings' voice. He took me to his house. I am not familiar with the area, but I tried to memorize the route. I could probably find it again. His eyes snapped up to meet hers and a fire blazed in them before he sighed. No, we need to get you to Doc Moore first. What happened out there anyway? Kate bit the inside of her lip as the hazy images came back to her. I ran from the church as soon as I knew it was him. He wore gloves all day, but he took them off for the ceremony, and I saw the scar. There was a horse outside. I'm ashamed to say I stole it. I think the owner would understand, Deputy Jennings broke in. It still wasn't right. Kate sighed. I don't even know whom to repay, nor do I have any money to do it. Anyway, before I was out of town, he must have realized I had escaped. Shots were fired at me. I don't know if he fired them, as I didn't look back. 
but I hadn't gotten far when I heard horses catching up to me. Knowing he had the upper hand with having knowledge of the land, I dismounted as soon as I saw some tall brush and sent the horse loose. But all the scratches and cuts, he began. Kate rolled her eyes. I got lost a few times, had to climb a few fences, and as I hadn't brought water with me, I am pretty sure I ended up dehydrated. I am honestly surprised I got as close as I did. Just another reason we should have Doc Moore check you out. Do you feel up to traveling? Kate performed a mental check of her body. She ached all over and felt a little dizzy, but she attributed that to lack of food. Yes, I think I'm all right. Could we possibly eat before we go? She asked, placing her hand on her stomach. I can't remember my last solid meal. I'm not much of a cook. Deputy Jennings held out a hand to help her up. But I'll try to throw some breakfast together. Kate took his hand and stood, but she had moved too quickly, and the room began to sway. Her knees buckled, but the deputy's strong arms caught her, and she fell against his chest. She looked up into his eyes, and a flicker of warmth stirred in their chocolatey depths. This was the feeling she had hoped to see from Bill Easterly. But what was she supposed to do with it from the deputy? He was not the one who had agreed to marry her. Here, I got you. He wrapped an arm around her, but averted his gaze as he led her out of the bedroom and to the kitchen. He helped her into a chair at the table before turning toward the stove. For the first time since she met him, Kate caught a glimpse of what he must have been like before his fiancé's death. His stiff demeanor softened as he pulled out a skillet and set it on the stovetop. After lighting the stove, he cracked a few eggs into the skillet and added a few slices of bread. Moments later, he was scraping half of the contents of the skillet onto a plate and heading back in her direction. It isn't much, Miss Whidbey. He handed her the plate and a fork, but I wasn't expecting company. Please call me Kate she said as she took the plate. I feel like now that you've seen me at my worst, we should at least be on a first-name basis. The deputy ducked his head, but nodded. Then you should call me Jessie. Deputy Jennings is too formal anyway. Thank you, Jessie. She took a bite of the eggs and tried not to make a face. Kate had cooked often with her mother and knew something wasn't right with the eggs. Her hunger, however, kept her shoveling the food in. Jesse filled his own plate and sat across from her. As he took his first bite, Kate chuckled, as his face scrunched in disgust as well. His brown eyes met hers and he smirked. I'm sorry, I am not the best cook. I always went to Pauline's house for dinner. Kate remembered the supper she had shared with Ellen and the others her first time in Sage Creek. Yes, Iris is a wonderful cook. I'm sorry about Pauline. Ellen said she was killed in a bank robbery. Kate hoped she wasn't crossing the line. Jesse dropped his eyes to his plate and pushed the eggs around. After a deep breath, he met her gaze. She was caught in the crossfire when the robbers were leaving the bank. She lived long enough to tell me that one of the men had a scar on his hand. Her eyes grew wide as her mouth formed a small O shape. I'm so sorry. No wonder you want to find him so badly. I promised to avenge her, Jessie said. Kate could understand that. Why didn't they kill us, I wonder? Probably because you complied with their demands. There was another deputy in the bank the day Pauline was shot and my guess is he tried to stop them. Pauline was just an unintended casualty. Perhaps it is none of my business, but it seems you really loved her. I did. Kate chewed on her lip. She had more questions. But did she dare ask them? She probably should abstain, but that had never been her nature. Then why did her family appear so distant towards you? Jesse set his fork down and fixed her with a steady gaze. Her brother blames me, 
They asked me to become a deputy when the robberies first started, but I was working on our homestead. I only took on the badge after she was killed, and I think her brother thinks I could have stopped it. Kate's heart twisted at his words. She wished she knew the right words to help, or that wouldn't be too personal. But as she did not, silence fell between them. When they had both cleaned their plate, Jesse took the dishes and put them in the sink to wash later. Let's visit Doc Moore to make sure you're all right. What will I do after? Kate asked quietly. I have no money, and what remains of my clothes are in Bill Easterly's wagon, if he does not get rid of them. She clasped her arms in front of her chest. Don't worry, he said, approaching her side. We will figure something out. I'm sure Martha Davis will have a room you can stay in for a few days. As soon as we get you checked out, the sheriff and the other deputies and I will create a plan to round up Bill Easterly and return your things. Jesse sat outside the clinic while Doc Moore examined Kate. He shouldn't feel nervous. After all, he barely knew the woman, but she had been through so much already. The bravery she displayed was admirable. The door opened and Kate stepped out. Thank you, doctor. It was nice to meet you, Emma, she said, before closing the door behind her. Ah, yes, Emma. The doctor's daughter was back in town after an unfortunate loss of her own. It would make sense to have her assist when a woman patient was involved. Jesse stood, his hat in his hand. He wanted to ask Kate how it went, but that was far too personal. Just cuts and bruises, Kate said, as if reading his mind. That's wonderful news, Jesse said. Shall we see about getting you a room at the inn? Yes, thank you. And then I would really like to help you catch Mr. Easterly. I know that is important, but let's make sure you recover first. Jesse wanted nothing more than to go after Easterly. In fact, it was taking every ounce of restraint not to head out now. But Kate felt like his responsibility as well, and he could not leave until he knew she would be taken care of. Kate nodded and fell into step beside him. When they reached the inn, Jesse rapped on the door again, and Martha opened it with a warm smile. Well, Deputy Jennings, to what do we owe this pleasure? Jesse tipped his hat. I'm sure you remember Miss Whidbey. She needs a place to stay for a few days. A sinking feeling flooded Jesse as Martha's smile faltered slightly. Of course, we can help her out for a few days. Martha opened the door and took Kate inside. As she did, Martha's husband Clark appeared and took Jesse aside. We can only give her two days, Jesse. Money is tight, and we have to leave the room open for paying customers. Jesse glanced in the direction the women had gone and shook his head. She has nowhere else to go, Clark. I know, and that's why we're allowing two days, but then she'll have to find a job or a husband. Jesse sighed. They both knew the only job for women in the West right now was at the saloons. I understand. Thank you for the two days. We'll figure something else out for the rest. Maybe Pastor Lewis would have some ideas on how to help. Footsteps on the stairs halted any further conversing, and Jesse looked up to see Kate descending with Martha at her side. Kate's tattered dress was gone, and she was now wearing a dark blue cotton dress that, while a little big, accentuated her beautiful blue eyes. Does it look all right? she asked smoothing the skirt with a self-conscious gesture. Martha was kind enough to loan it to me. Jesse shook his head. You look fine, and definitely more suited to riding now than what you were previously wearing. Right, yes, Kate said. Well, shall we go get the sheriff and see about finding a robber? Jesse led the way out of the inn and back towards the sheriff's office. Sheriff Johnson looked up from the desk as they entered. Afternoon, Jesse. Who's this you got with you? This is Kate Whidbey. She was robbed outside Belleville by the same gang that robbed our bank and killed Pauline and Dixon. 
I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. Sheriff Johnson nodded at Kate. She knows where one of them lives, Jesse finished. The sheriff nearly knocked his chair over as he stood and slammed his palms on the desk. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go get the sucker. Can you draw us a map? Jesse asked, turning to Kate. No, I'm coming with you. Jesse shook his head. There's no way you are coming with us. It's too dangerous. What if Mr. Easterly is still there? Give me a gun then. I shot with my father and brother. I can protect myself. I'm no good at directions, but I could probably remember the route if I wrote it again. Jesse looked to the sheriff, expecting him to refuse. But the elder man shrugged his shoulders and said, If she knows the way, then I guess she rides with us. Fine, but you do not approach the house with us. We have no idea what we might encounter, so you can take us as far as the homestead, but then you let us go in, understood? Kate opened her mouth as if to argue more, but then sighed and nodded. Chapter 10 Which way now? Jesse asked, his patience wearing thin. Kate scrunched her face and thought. Um, left, I think. Yes, left. Are you sure this time? Once outside of Lisbon, Jesse had allowed Kate to ride alongside him to determine the direction. But so far, she'd made two wrong turns and cost them at least an hour. I'm doing my best, she said sharply. I was only there once. Jesse sighed and ran a hand across his chin. You're right. I'm sorry. So, left? She looked around them again and then nodded with force. Yes, left, I'm sure. They moved further along the road until they crested a small hill. A house at the base came into view. This is it. Kate proclaimed triumphantly. That's far enough, Jesse said. You sure this is the place? Kate frowned at him. I'm sure. Okay, Jeb, you stay here with Miss Whidby. Jesse and I will go scout it out, Sheriff Johnson said. Jeb nodded, and Jesse led the way down the hill, keeping his eyes open for any signs of the masked men. They tried to keep the horses quiet to aid in the surprise factor. When they reached the front porch of the ranch house, Jesse pulled Molly up short. The cabin door was ajar. With one finger to his lips, he used the other hand to point the issue out to the sheriff, who nodded in return. The two men dismounted quietly and drew their guns. Sheriff Johnson led the way, pushing the door fully open with the muzzle of his gun. As they stepped into the room, it was clear it had been torn apart. Up-ended chairs and clothes lay strewn about the room. The main room had a kitchen to the side, which was empty, but a doorway at the end of the room was closed. Again, Jesse took a cover position as Sheriff Johnson pushed open the door. A large bed filled most of the room. A silent, unmoving figure lay sprawled on the bed a pool of red surrounding him. Kate said Bill Easterly had a scar on his hand, Jesse whispered. We should see if it's him. The sheriff nodded, and the two men stepped closer, still remaining alert for anyone else present. Jesse glanced down at the man on the bed. A gunshot to the chest had been his end, but neither of his hands displayed a scar. His ice-blue eyes stared into nothingness. It's not him, Jesse said. Let's get out of here before Easterly returns. He took a step back and something crunched under his feet. Stooping down, he picked up the shattered pieces of what might have been a brooch or a locket. He dropped the pieces in his pocket to show to Kate. Perhaps the item had belonged to either her or Ellen. A part of him wanted to scour the place for any more belongings of Kate but there would be time for that later. Jesse followed the sheriff out of the house and back up the hill where Kate and Jeb were waiting. Did you find him? Kate asked. 
There was a man in the house, but it was not easterly, as there was no scar on his hand. This man had blue eyes, and it looked like there had been a fight. Kate nodded. One of the other robbers had blue eyes, the one who opened the coach door. Did you find any of my things? We need to speak with their sheriff to search the house more, but I did find this. Does it mean anything to you? He dropped the pieces in Kate's hand. For a moment, her brow furrowed as she tried to make sense of the shattered item, and then tears welled in her eyes and a few escaped and trailed down her cheek. This was mine, my mother's brooch. The last thing I had of hers, it was taken in the robbery. Jesse's heart ached at her tears. He knew that emotion all too well. The only thing he had left of Paula was a handkerchief she had once given him. When he wanted a piece of her near, Jesse would pull it to his face and inhale the fresh scent of sage which still lingered on it. Jesse, why don't you take her back to Sage Creek? Jeb and I will work with the men here to see if we can find any more items, the sheriff suggested. Was there any sign of a woman living in the cabin when you were here? He asked Kate. She shook her head, but her eyes remained on the broken pieces in her palm. No, there was not a feminine touch in the whole place. I had a few other pieces of jewelry, and I know Ellen and the other woman did as well. We will gather everything we can find and set up a time for you to claim it later. Thank you for your help. Let me know if I can help in any other way. Jesse couldn't stop thinking about Kate after he dropped her off at the inn. Clark Davis had said they could grant her two nights, which meant she only had one more night after tonight. Unless Sheriff Johnson found some of her jewelry or money, she would have no way to continue paying for her room. Nor would she have the money to return home, and he needed her to stay. She was the one person who could identify Bill Easterly and avenge Pauline's death. But to stay, she would need to marry or find employment. And Jesse knew the only place hiring women right now was the saloon. His Christian duty and desire for justice conflicted with his heart, and he pointed Molly toward the cemetery. Though she wouldn't be able to answer, he needed to discuss this idea with the one woman it would matter to. The cemetery was empty when he arrived, and he threw Molly's reins around a tree branch before making his way over to the newly covered plot that housed Pauline's body. He knew she was no longer there, but it was where he felt closest to her. He removed his hat and ran a hand through his hair as he stared down at the dirt. I hope you can see me from where you are, Pauline. I feel a little silly talking to you here, but I want you to know that I miss you. However, I am now in a bind. There is a woman here who was robbed by the same men responsible for your death. In fact, she was supposed to marry one of the men. She escaped, but now she has no money and no family. I do not love her as my heart still belongs to you, but I feel it is my Christian duty as a man to marry her and take her in. I know you cannot answer me from where you are, but I am here, hoping you will understand and forgive me. Jesse closed his eyes for a moment, and though he was not expecting an answer, he felt a breeze surround him almost like a caress, and he knew what he had to do. Opening his eyes, he nodded at the grave, replaced his hat, and returned to Molly. Then he headed back to town. Kate watched from the small window to make sure Jessie was gone before she slipped out of the inn. With no money and no marriage, her option now was to find employment. She still didn't have many skills, but thanks to Abigail, she now had experience in teaching, and surely it couldn't be too different here. But where was the schoolhouse? She supposed she could ask Martha, but there couldn't be too many buildings and she did not mind the walk. Walking had always been relaxing in Boston, and she hoped to find a little of that peace again. The school was at the end of town, a small one-room building with white clapboards and a bell in a small steeple at the top. 
The day was just ending when Kate arrived, and a flurry of children raced past her and out of the door. When she was sure they were all gone, Kate stepped into the doorway. A young brunette woman was gathering papers at the desk up front. Excuse me? Kate's voice echoed in the now empty building. The woman stopped her shuffling and turned to look at her. Can I help you? Yes, my name is Kate Whidbey. I'm new in town, and I was wondering if there might be a job here at the school. The woman shook her head. I'm sorry, we don't have enough children to need two teachers. Oh, I understand, Kate said, swallowing her disappointment. Thank you anyway. She turned to leave, and then paused. Do you know of any place in town that is hiring? Just the saloon, the woman said with a small smile. Right, thank you. A feeling of despair crept in on Kate as she left the school building, but she decided to try other establishments anyway. Unfortunately, she received a similar response in the general store, the cafe, and the post office. Shoulders slumped, Kate returned to the inn. Perhaps the Davises would have some work she could do. What a long face, Kate, Martha asked as Kate entered the parlor. I was out looking for a job, Kate said, her eyes downcast. But no one is hiring. She glanced up. I don't suppose you need help here at the inn. Martha's brow creased. No, I'm sorry, dear, we don't. It's been a tough winter for everyone around here. I understand. Kate forced a tight smile. I'll figure something out, I'm sure. Why don't you sit down and I'll get you some tea? Martha asked, pointing to an empty chair. Kate nodded and sank into the chair. She had been so sure this move was God's will for her. But now she was stranded in Sage Creek with no husband, no employment, and no money to even go back to Boston. Lord, please show me what I should do next, she thought, as Martha returned with a teacup and saucer. Tiny wisps of steam curled into the air as Kate took the proffered cup. I know you have had a difficult time the last few days, but are you doing okay? Martha asked as she settled onto the sofa with her own tea. I am trying to be, Kate said, blowing on her tea as she thought about her words. In truth, I am worried about what to do next. I know that I cannot stay here forever, but without money or a husband, I am unsure what my next step should be. I know that can be daunting, but I do believe that God will provide a way for you. Kate hoped so, but she certainly wasn't feeling God's presence at the moment. Just then, the door to the inn opened, and Ellen's frantic voice carried through. Kate, are you all right? Kate glanced up to see Ellen hurrying across the room towards her. She set her teacup on the table and stood to greet her friend. Ellen, what are you doing here? James told me he saw you riding out of town with the sheriff and the deputies this morning. What happened? I thought you were getting married. Kate shook her head and motioned for Ellen to join them in the parlor. Would you believe that the man I was supposed to marry is the same man that robbed us? What? Ellen covered her mouth as she sank into the chair. Yes, I suppose I have rotten luck. Kate paused to take a sip of her tea. Something seemed off about him when he picked me up, but when I saw the scar on his hand, I ran. I went looking for Deputy Jennings, got disoriented along the way, and he found me near his home. We rode out there this morning, but Mr. Easterly was gone. I don't know what I'm going to do now, Ellen. Even if they find my clothes, the money and jewelry will be long gone. I have no money to pay for my room here and I knocked on all the establishment doors this afternoon. The only place in need of work is the saloon, which I can't do. I came out here to get married so I wouldn't be a burden to my brother, and I couldn't even do that right. Ellen leaned back and regarded Kate. Perhaps you could stay with us. Kate shook her head. 
I couldn't do that. Your family does not know me, and they are in mourning for their daughter. It would be too big of an imposition. Maybe I could telegraph my brother and ask for money. I know Abigail might object, and I hate the idea of being an even bigger burden to him than I already am. But I don't see as I have any other option. Well, there is one other option, Ellen said. What's that? Kate asked. You could still get married. Kate's forehead furrowed in confusion. Had her friend misunderstood her? Didn't you hear what I said? The man I was going to marry is a thief and a murderer. I did not mean him, Ellen said, waving her hand. But this is the West. In case you haven't noticed, there are far more men than women. Perhaps you could find another man looking for a bride. It would be worth at least checking the papers before you head back. Kate bit her lip. Could she do it? What if she chose another outlaw like Bill? Surely, the odds of that would be astronomical. But with her luck? Of course, it might be better than admitting to her brother she was wrong. She could just imagine his reproachful look when he learned she had lost all the money. You're right, Kate said with a sigh. I guess there is no harm in at least looking. Jesse approached the inn with a sense of purpose. It wasn't how he had planned his life to go, but he felt at peace with his decision. The lanterns at the inn were still lit when he arrived. After a deep exhale, he dismounted Molly, tied her to the post, and knocked on the inn door. Deputy Jennings? Martha asked as she opened the door. Is everything all right? Yes, ma'am, he said, removing his hat. I was just wondering if I could speak with Miss Whidbey for a minute. Let me announce your arrival. Why don't you go have a seat in the parlor? Martha pointed to her right, and Jesse walked that direction as she turned to go up the stairs. No one else was in the parlor, so Jesse chose a straight-backed chair near the entrance and sat down. His hands curled and released the brim of his hat as he waited for Kate to arrive. Jesse, to what do I owe this visit? Kate stood in the doorway, her dark hair down and framing her face. She was not Pauline, but she was pretty, even more so with her hair down. Jesse stood and cleared his throat. I've come with a proposition for you, Kate. I know we don't know each other well, but I also know you have no money to keep paying your room here or to purchase a ticket home. Kate's posture stiffened, and her chin lifted defiantly in the air. I was planning to wire my brother and ask for money to make the trip home, which was not a perfect scenario, as the whole reason for me coming out here was not to burden him. But Ellen gave me the idea of looking for another man in search of a wife. The thing is, Jesse interrupted, holding up his hand to stop her rambling. I need you to stay here since you're the only one who knows what Bill Easterly looks like. He cringed at his callous words. That wasn't exactly what he meant. What I mean is that I have a solution that will allow you to stay here. I could use some help at the homestead. You tasted my cooking. A nervous laugh bubbled out of his throat, and he cleared it again. I guess what I'm saying is I have a proposition that would help us both out. He paused and glanced at Kate for a reaction, but her face was stoic. He got the feeling she didn't like being interrupted. We could get married, he said quickly, before he lost his nerve. That way you'd have a home and I could protect you in case Easterly showed up again. And if we ever find him, you would be able to identify him. Jesse forced his mouth shut to stop the flow of words. He needed to give her time to think and process. He continued curling and uncurling his hat brim as he waited for her to answer. A tiny bead of sweat trickled down his back, and while he was used to sweating from the heat, he was not used to sweating from embarrassment. This moment was more uncomfortable than any other he could remember in his recent past. Kate tilted her head and stared at him. Another bead of sweat joined the first as he waited for her response. 
When she finally spoke, her voice was soft. I knew when I agreed to come out here that I wouldn't be marrying for love, but I hoped I would at least find a decent man and a nice home. While my time here hasn't gone as I'd hoped, I would prefer an alternative to returning home and burdening my brother again. Since I am limited in my options, and it seems this arrangement would benefit the both of us, then I accept your proposal. Okay, Jesse said with a nod. I'll speak with Pastor Lewis and set it up for tomorrow afternoon. He glanced at her attire, which was a simple cream top and navy blue skirt. Do you need time to get a dress for the wedding? Kate shook her head. The sheriff was able to retrieve some of my clothes. He dropped them off a few hours ago. I can find something which will work for the occasion. She gave him a tentative smile. I appreciate all of you going after Mr. Easterly and returning what possessions could be found, even if I wasn't the sole reason. You're welcome, Jesse said as he replaced his hat. Have a good evening, Miss Whidby, and I'll see you tomorrow. As he left, Jesse wondered what he had gotten himself into. Kate Whidby was nothing like his docile Pauline had been. Chapter 11 Kate stood in front of the mirror inspecting her appearance. It didn't matter whether she turned left or right. The pale blue dress felt far too plain to be getting married in. If only her mother's wedding dress hadn't been torn and dirtied. A knock sounded at the door, and Martha stuck her head in. Good morning. Clark told me the good news, and I thought maybe I had something that might help. Can I come in? Of course, Kate said. I don't look like much of a bride anyway. Maybe I can help with that, Martha said as she entered the room and shut the door behind her. Clark and I never had a daughter, but I kept this anyway. She held out a long white dress with a lace neckline and ruffled sleeves. I think I was a little bigger than you, but we could tie the sash tighter and add a few carefully hidden pins. Kate's eyes flooded with emotion as she reached out to touch the dress. Why are you doing this for me? You barely know me. Martha smiled. That may be, but we know Jesse. He has always treated people fairly and done what he can to help, just like he's doing now. You both have had a rough patch starting out, but maybe you can find a greener pasture together. Besides, here in Sage Creek, we take care of our own, and since you're about to be one of us, I can't have you getting married in a blue gingham dress, pretty as it is. Thank you, Kate said, wiping a tear from the corner of her eye. I hope you'll come to the ceremony. It would mean a lot to me. This time it was Martha's turn to sniff. Of course Clark and I will be there, and I have a feeling we will see a lot more of each other. Now let's get you into this dress. Kate did not argue as she stepped out of her dress and into the one Martha had brought. As the woman had said, it was slightly bigger, but Martha was able to pin much of the excess away. And when Kate looked in the mirror, tears filled her eyes once again. This time, they were tears of joy. It was not her mother's dress, but she had no doubt that her mother would be proud of the way she looked. Kate turned to the elder woman and embraced her. Thank you, Martha. I do not know how I can repay you for all your kindness. Oh, hush, the woman said, wiping a tear from her eye. I am happy to help, and you can repay me by being a good wife to Jesse. He suffered mightily with Pauline's death, and he needs a good woman looking out for him. I will, I promise. Good, then let's get you married. Jesse stood at the front of the chapel, rocking back and forth on his heels. He could not believe how nervous he was. When he'd told Clark about his decision to marry Kate, the man had offered to bring her to the church at the appointed time and serve as witness. Yet the church bell had just finished ringing the two o'clock hour, 
and there was still no sign of them. Jeb and Sheriff Johnson looked at him with raised eyebrows from their position in the front row. Clearly, they thought he had been stood up, and Jesse had no doubt they were thinking that their time would be better spent patrolling the town. Jesse swallowed his apprehension and shook his head. Maybe this had been a big mistake. I'm sure they'll be here shortly, Pastor Lewis said, as Jesse looked toward the front doors once more. A few moments later, the doors flew open, and Martha hurried in, waving her hands. I'm sorry we're late. We had to do a quick change. Kate stepped in next, and Jesse's breath caught in his throat. Her dark hair was pulled back with combs, except for a few tendrils that framed her face. The cream dress she was wearing showed off her slim waist and made her eyes appear even more blue. There was no denying she was a beautiful woman. And a moment of guilt flooded him. He should not be thinking about this woman in that way. His heart was reserved for Pauline. She was who he was supposed to be marrying. But Pauline was here no longer, and he knew that she would want this for him. She never wanted him to be alone, and though Kate and Pauline were different women, Jesse believed they would have been friends if they'd ever met. A nervous smile pulled on Kate's lips as she stepped into the small chapel. A blonde man with small spectacles and a black suit and white collar stood at the front near Jesse. In his hands was an open book. Kate assumed he must be the pastor. Next to him, Jesse stood in a similar black suit, only without the white collar. Instead, he wore a high-collared white shirt with a black tie. His dark hair was combed, and his face appeared even more chiseled without his hat. As she walked up the aisle, she realized the sheriff and Jeb were sitting in the front row as guests for Jesse. She was glad Clark and Martha had come with her. They weren't her real family, but aside from Ellen, they were the closest friends she had here. She wondered briefly if she should have told Ellen about the wedding, but there hadn't really been time. Plus, she was marrying the man who should have been marrying Ellen's granddaughter. Kate was sure she did not need the reminder. I hope you don't mind me saying so, miss, but you look beautiful. Clark whispered and patted her hand in a fatherly gesture before joining Martha in the front row. A light pink covered her cheeks as she stopped beside Jesse. Hello, miss. I'm Pastor Lewis. Can I get your full name? The pastor had a kind voice and seemed much more coherent than the last pastor who had almost married her. Mary Catherine Whidbey, Kate said, but everyone just calls me Kate. That's fine, the man said with a smile. His gaze shifted from her to the people in the pews as he began. Dear friends, we are gathered here today to join Deputy Jesse Jennings and Mary Catherine Whidbey in holy matrimony. Jesse, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, to protect until death do you part? I do, Jesse said. The pastor turned to Kate. And do you, Kate, take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to cherish until death do you part? I do, Kate said. Do you have rings, Jesse? Pastor Lewis asked. Kate was surprised when Jesse dug in his coat pocket and pulled out two gold bands. She'd had no idea he had purchased wedding rings. Very well. Place the ring on Kate's finger and repeat after me. When Jessie took her hand, Kate felt the smallest tingle shoot down her arm. This was so different from the near disaster with Bill Easterly, and almost what she had imagined her wedding to be like. He slid the ring on her finger as he spoke. With this ring, I thee wed. A feeling of warmth followed the tingle, and she glanced up to see if Jessie had felt it, but he was focused on placing the other ring in her palm. Kate, if you'll put the ring on Jesse's hand and repeat after me, Pastor Lewis said. Kate fumbled with the ring, but managed to secure it on Jesse's hand and repeat the words. 
then by the power vested to me by God and the great state of Texas, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Though Kate was unsure what to expect next, the kiss from Jessie, even though it was quick and just on her cheek, had not even been an inkling in her mind. Her cheek flamed with heat, and she was sure it was emblazoned for everyone to see, though no one said anything about it. Instead, the sheriff, Jeb, and Clark surrounded her husband, shaking his hand and congratulating him. Her husband. The words felt foreign, and yet not wrong, on her tongue. You looked beautiful, Martha said, pulling her in for another embrace. Thank you. I can return your dress once we get back to the inn. I suppose I'll need to pack my things shortly. Martha patted her hand. You keep the dress. Oh, I couldn't. You have a much better chance of having a daughter to pass it to one day than I do, Martha said with a smile. This time, Kate knew her cheeks flamed. She had not considered that aspect of the marriage, but Martha was right. At some point, Jessie was sure to want children. Shall we go retrieve your things from the inn? He asked, appearing at her side. Yes, of course. She took his arm and followed him out of the church. The sheriff and Jeb bade farewell and returned to their duties, while Martha and Clark accompanied them back to the inn. Once there, Kate hurried to her room to pack her things. Then she said goodbye to Clark and Martha before following Jesse to his wagon. He loaded her things and then turned to her. I know this isn't what we both imagined for our futures, but we can make the best of this situation if we both agree to try. I promise I will be a loyal and kind husband. A smile formed on her lips as she nodded. I want to make this work as well. I will do my best to be the kind of wife you need. All right, then, he said, and held out a hand to help her into the wagon. She settled on the seat, and he climbed up beside her and pointed the wagon toward his homestead. The ride to Jessie's home, and now hers, was quiet. But when the homestead came into view, the enormity of her decision landed on her shoulders. She would now be sharing a house with a man she barely knew, and they hadn't discussed intimacy. He expected her to be a good wife, and that came with certain duties but would he expect her to fulfill them tonight? Kate assumed, as this was more a marriage of convenience, that they would wait until they knew each other better, but she realized they should have discussed it. I'd give you the tour, he said with a small smile, but you've been here before. It did Kate's heart good to see him nervous as well. That's all right, you could give me the tour anyway. Jessie smiled and opened the door. Well then, come inside, and while you get situated, I'll come back out and get your things. Kate inspected the house from a woman's standpoint as she entered this time. It was nothing grand, but it did have a homier feel than Bill Easterly's place had. The kitchen was clean, and everything appeared to have a set place. The main room housed a few chairs and a small couch. Beside the bedroom was another door which Jessie pushed open to display a wash basin and a freestanding tub. You have a tub? Kate asked with surprise. Even in Boston, only the rich had a separate room for tubs. I saved up for it. It was going to be my wedding present to Pauline, Jessie said with a sad smile. Oh, I'm sorry. Kate felt awful for reminding him once again of Pauline, but was glad to know he had cared enough about his future bride to do something nice for her. Another stark difference from Bill Easterly. It's fine. Jesse cleared his throat and continued the tour. You can sleep in the bedroom, of course, and I'll take the couch in the main room, Jesse said. I'll grab your things and be right back. Well, at least that answered the question of whether he expected intimacy tonight or not. Kate wandered into the bedroom while Jessie returned to the wagon. A wrought iron bed covered in a quilt sat squarely in the middle. She wondered briefly if Pauline had made the quilt. There was a dresser with a mirror, 
and a small table beside the bed, and on top of the table, Kate was delighted to find a Bible. If Jesse were a believer, then perhaps this could be a happy marriage after all. She had just picked up the book when he re-entered with her things. I'm sorry, she said, dropping it back on the table. Don't be. He set her trunk on the floor and crossed to her. Are you a believer? I am, she said. I was worried I might not marry a Christian man, but I guess God was watching out for me after all. Would you like to go to church with me on Sunday, then? Jesse asked. Yes, I would love that. As they shared a smile, Kate began to feel that maybe everything would work out after all. Chapter 12 Kate woke early the next morning. Though it had been nice sleeping in a real bed, it still wasn't a bed she was used to. She pulled a dress on and opened the bedroom door quietly, but was surprised to see Jessie already awake and reading at the table. I'm sorry, I thought I would be up before you, she said, stepping into the kitchen area. I'm always up early to read. Jessie said with a smile. I feel it's my best time with the Lord. He gestured at his mug. I made some coffee. Do you drink it? Kate shook her head. No, I'm afraid I never developed a taste. Do you have any tea? Afraid not, but as it's Saturday, we can go into town and get some. The sheriff gave me a few days off to help you get situated. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Have you eaten? Kate asked, feeling like she should be doing something. I could make breakfast. Breakfast would be nice, Jesse said. After a few moments of fiddling with the stove, she managed to light the burner and set a skillet on to warm. In the icebox, she found eggs and bacon and added them to the skillet. Soon, the sound of sizzling bacon filled the room. Kate found a bit of bread left and added it to the skillet to warm. When everything was ready, she loaded up two plates and brought one to Jessie and set the other down for herself. Before he picked up his fork, he closed his eyes, and Kate followed suit. Lord, thank you for this food you have provided for us. Help keep us safe and help us to keep our focus on you. Amen. Amen, Kate echoed. She watched with bated breath while Jessie took a bite of his food hoping it would meet his standard. Though not as good a cook as her mother had been, cooking was one of the few womanly skills Kate could do. His eyebrows arched up as he glanced at her. This is really good, Kate. Much better than the fare I was making myself. I wasn't going to say anything, Kate said with a smile, but you could use some cooking lessons. I'm sorry you were subjected to my cooking the other morning, and I'm mighty glad you're taking over that chore, as I might very well end up poisoning the both of us, he said with a chuckle, as he returned her smile. It was amazing how much a smile changed his face. The hard lines disappeared and tiny crinkles appeared at the corner of his eyes. Kate wasn't sure how, but she was determined to bring that smile around more often. Jessie glanced at Kate as they pulled into town. While she wasn't Pauline, she had a charm about her, and her cooking was definitely an improvement on his own. I need to stop in and talk to Sheriff Johnson for a bit. Are you good to secure the food items you need on your own? Jessie asked as he pulled up in front of the general store. I think I can manage, Kate said. Jessie helped her down from the wagon and placed a few bills in her palm. Get whatever you need, and I'll be back in a minute to help you load it up. Jessie watched her walk into the general store and then turned toward the sheriff's office. I see you couldn't wait to replace Pauline. James said, as he stepped out of the saloon and into Jesse's path. The smell of alcohol filled the air around him. It's not like that, James. Kate is the only person who knows what the man who killed Pauline looks like, and she needed a home. I had one. It's as simple as that. 
You can tell yourself that all you want, James said, poking a finger in Jessie's chest. But it looks like you've replaced her to everyone else. James, go home and sleep it off, Jessie said, stepping out of the way. We can talk more when you have a clearer head. This isn't finished, Jessie Jennings, James roared. But he lumbered away in the opposite direction, using the sides of the buildings to keep himself upright. Jesse sighed as he continued to the sheriff's office. James was another problem he would have to deal with soon, but his most pressing concern was still Bill Easterly. The sheriff was seated at his desk, scanning papers. Any word on Easterly, sheriff? Jesse asked as he sat across from the sheriff. He hasn't returned to his house, but a few nearby towns have telegraphed they have seen him. So apparently he's still in the area. Unfortunately, they are out of my jurisdiction, and we can't just go mounting up without an invitation. So are we still just waiting and hoping he shows up again? Jesse tried to contain the frustration in his voice. It's all we can do right now, Jesse. I'm sorry. Jesse sent up a silent prayer for patience before saying, Understood, Sheriff. I'll just be sure to keep my eyes open should the opportunity arise. We will all be watching. Jesse shook hands with the sheriff and then made his way back to the general store. Kate was exiting the general store as he returned, her arms laden with packages. Here, let me help you with those, he said, relieving her of a few of the parcels. Did you find everything you needed? Yes, thank you, Kate said, but her eyes were cast down. What is it? Jesse asked as he placed the parcels in the wagon. Nothing, let's just go, Kate said. Jesse wanted to press the issue, but he didn't want to cause a scene in town. As the wagon pulled out of town, though, he turned to her. Please, tell me what happened. Kate sniffed. There was a woman in the store who heard we got married. She told me I had no respect for Pauline marrying you so quickly after her death. Will they all treat me like this? What good is staying if I'm to be an outcast? No, not everyone will treat you like that, Jesse said, gritting his teeth and wondering who would be so cruel to Kate. He could think of only a few, with Pauline's closest friend, Rebecca, being at the top of the list. A part of him wanted to turn the wagon around and find the woman and talk some sense into her. But he knew that would only make the matter worse. Most people in Sage Creek are kind, decent folks. But you have to remember that Pauline was born here, so some folks have known her a very long time. I know they will come around once they get to know you. As Kate flashed him a small smile, Jesse felt a sliver of the emotional wall he had built around his heart chip away. He hadn't known her long, but he had been telling the truth. There was something about Kate that was endearing, and he knew the town would accept her if they would give her a chance. Thank you. I suppose I should be used to the attention. Even back in Boston, I garnered it because I was not the kind of woman society wanted. I suppose I had hoped it would be different here. Jessie took her hand and squeezed it. It will be. Many of Pauline's friends are still grieving, but with time their hearts will be softened. He realized as he said the words that they could apply to him as well. Pauline still had the primary place in his heart, but there was now a tiny opening for Kate and he believed that one day that tiny opening would expand. Chapter 13 When Kate's eyes opened the next morning, she took a minute to orient herself. She was in Sage Creek, and she was married to Jesse Jennings. He'd been so kind to her yesterday after the incident at the general store, and he hadn't even complained when she'd burned the biscuits for dinner. He'd helped her with the dishes, and they'd even read the Bible and prayed together before retiring for the night. He was not the man she'd come here to marry, 
but she believed he was a man she could find happiness with. With a sigh, she slipped out of bed and rummaged through her things for her nicest dress. Though she wanted to attend church, she was afraid of another incident. The worst part of it was that she did not know which women had been friends with Pauline and therefore might harbor the same feelings the woman from yesterday did. Still, if she stayed home, she had no doubt that she would become the subject of idle gossip and that would be even worse. She pulled on her nicest dress and grabbed a bonnet for her hair. A glance in the mirror showed her dark hair hanging in uniformed ringed curls around her face. Kate pinched her cheeks and pursed her lips to give them some color, and then exited the bedroom. Jesse sat waiting for her in the main room, wearing a similar suit to the one he had worn to the wedding. You look nice, he said, glancing up from his Bible as she walked in. Thank you. I hope I'm dressed appropriately. She smoothed a hand down her dress, wishing she could smooth her nerves as easily. No one will be able to find fault in your dress, he said, before taking a sip of his coffee. A soft blush crawled up her cheeks, and Kate's eyes dropped to the floor as she hurried to make breakfast. She hoped he wouldn't mind eating the same breakfast as the previous day, but it was an easy one to make. After breakfast, which he received with a smile, he pushed back his chair and asked, Are you ready? As I'll ever be, I guess, Kate said with a false bravado. He walked around the table to take her hand. Don't worry, it will be fine. She hoped he was right and allowed him to lead her to the wagon and help her up. Like the day before, the ride to town was quiet and several other wagons were in the churchyard when they arrived. Jessie helped her down, and they joined the throng of people walking in on foot. Kate squared her shoulders as they entered the small chapel, and she prepared for the onslaught of conspiratorial whispers and aside glances she expected. What she hadn't been prepared for was Ellen, calling her name and hurrying her direction. So it's true, the elder woman said as she took in Jessie, standing by Kate's side. I wasn't sure if I should believe James as he was drunker than a skunk when he told me. Are you angry? Kate asked, biting her lip. I wanted to tell you, but it happened kind of suddenly, and I was worried it might bring up painful memories. Jessie showed up after you left the hotel that night, and I don't know... She shrugged. It just made sense. Angry? Of course I'm not angry, silly girl, she said loudly, her voice carrying across the room. In fact, she lowered her voice and leaned in. I rather feel like it makes us almost family. You marry the man who was almost my grandson-in-law? I'm glad you did it. You might be the only one. Kate said, glancing around. I don't think everyone else is so happy. Nonsense, she patted Kate's hand. When they get to know you like I do, they will love you. Now, let's go get a seat and let them gossip behind us. Kate laughed at the elder woman's nonchalance and felt her anxiety slide away. Ellen was the one person she had hoped not to anger in her decision. And if she could accept Kate and Jessie, then Kate would be fine. Though she could feel stares burning her back, Kate was able to relax a little and enjoy the service with Ellen by her side. It hadn't been that long since she'd been at a service, but she had definitely missed the music and the message. When the service ended, she hugged Ellen and thanked her for her support before heading back to the wagon with Jessie. That wasn't so bad, was it? He asked, helping her up. Not as bad as I had expected, but it might have been were it not for Ellen. That woman truly has been a godsend. I'm glad. Jessie climbed up beside her and took the reins, snapping them to get the horses moving. Kate nodded and folded her hands in her lap. 
As they made their way back to the homestead, she realized she had yet to write her brother. Do you have paper and a pencil at the house? I believe a letter to my brother regarding my situation is long overdue. Of course. It took him only a moment to find the supplies for her, and with paper in hand, Kate closed the bedroom door behind her and sat down at the dresser to write. Dear Robert, I am sorry it has taken me so long to correspond. My trip has been adventurous, to say the least. I met a wonderful woman on the trip. She reminds me very much of Mother, as she's young at heart. Our stagecoach was robbed. Don't worry, I am fine, though the money I brought with me is gone. God has provided me with a kind Christian man for a husband, though, and we are getting along fine. I hope all is well with you, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Kate Kate reread the letter. Well, it wasn't the entire truth, but that was a little much to write in one letter. Perhaps she could tell the story in little bits. Satisfied, she folded the letter and sealed it in an envelope. Chapter 14 Jesse woke to the early morning sun's rays coming in the window. He had overslept. With a start, he jumped up from the couch and reached for his trousers. He had just gotten them up when the bedroom door opened and Kate walked in. Oh, I'm sorry, she said, holding a hand to her eyes. A soft pink blush flooded her cheeks. It's okay, Jesse said, tucking his shirt in. I'm dressed now. You can uncover your eyes. I suppose I should get used to seeing you like that, Kate said. But he noticed her eyes remained focused in the opposite direction. He bit back a smile as he answered. Most days I'll be up before you will. It's not often I sleep in. But I can also take to changing in the washroom if it makes you feel more comfortable. Oh, that is not necessary, Kate said as she entered the kitchen. After all, this is your house. It's our house now. Jesse filled the kettle with water to make the coffee. It was the one cooking area Kate was still challenged in, as she didn't drink it. So he often made it himself. In all other areas of the kitchen, though, Kate was extraordinary. She was not only a great cook, but an excellent baker. In fact, her cooking was so good that Jesse had been forced to let his belt out a notch. Another flood of pink filled her cheeks at his statement, and she turned quickly to the stove. She opened the firebox, but the matches kept going out before she got the wood lit. Had he made her nervous? Here, let me help. Jessie reached for the match in her hand, but ended up grabbing her hand. Her eyes turned up to his, and Jessie found himself falling in their blue depths. He shook his head to clear the image of her lips that had flooded his brain and lit the firebox for her. Thank you. She held his eyes a moment longer before reaching for the skillet. You're welcome. Jesse cleared his throat and finished his task of making the coffee. As it boiled, he thought about the last few nights with Kate. At first, she had just been a woman sharing his house but he had come to see she was courteous and kind. In the evenings, she would often darn his socks or knit while he read from the Bible. It was for all these reasons that he felt the need to do something special for her. He waited until she had joined him at the table, a pancake on each of their plates, before asking, Kate, would you like to go for a ride this afternoon? I'd like to show you the sage fields near here, and the weather is supposed to be warm. He took a bite of pancake, enjoying the delicious flavor as he waited for her response. I would love that. Kate's blue eyes sparkled. It feels like I haven't been on a horse in forever, if you don't count the night I was fleeing for my life, that is. He swallowed and smiled. Then it settled. I will saddle up the horses after I finish this wonderful meal, and we will go for a ride. When his plate was empty, he handed it to Kate and then headed for the barn to saddle the horses. 
The sound of whistling surprised him, and he realized it was coming from his lips. He paused. He shouldn't be feeling this happy, should he? Shouldn't he still be mourning Pauline's death? He had felt, at the gravesite when he talked to her, that Pauline would be all right with his decision to marry Kate. But would she want him to be happy with her? Confusion clouded his previous happy mood for a moment, but he shook his head as he gathered the reins of both horses. He knew that Pauline would want him to be happy. Though he did not whistle, some of his earlier joy returned as he walked back toward the house where Kate was waiting. The air was warm and there was little more than a light breeze flowing, but it tussled Kate's dark hair, sending it flowing around her shoulders in waves. He wondered briefly what it would feel like between his fingers. When would this feel like the marriage he had craved instead of one of convenience? Which one is mine? she asked, breaking up his daydream. Her eyes held a mischievous gleam. This is Sadie. He held out the mare's reins to her. Hello, Sadie. When she placed her hand on the horse's nose and rubbed gently, Jessie could tell she had been around horses before. She's beautiful, Jessie. Thank you. He didn't know why her compliment sent a heat pricking at his cheeks, but he averted his gaze in hopes of masking it. Shall we get going, then? She nodded and he helped her into the saddle before returning to Mount Molly. So are these fields how the town got its name? Kate asked, as he led the way to the lavender-colored fields that lay on the outer edge of town. That's actually a funny story, Jessie said. Evidently, there was a family feud when the town was first being founded. One half moved out near the sage fields and wanted to name the town Sagewood. The other half moved out toward the creek and wanted to name it Creekville. Eventually, they reunited and decided to combine names. Hence, Sage Creek. That is a lovely story and an even lovelier name, Kate said with a smile. I've always loved Sage. I think it's because purple is my favorite color. Then you are in for a treat, Jessie said. A few minutes later, the land sloped down, and a sea of purple lay before them. Kate gasped beside him. I've never seen anything like it. The awe in her voice flooded him with warmth. Jessie smiled and led the way down the slope. Huge purple sage bushes filled the area, creating a carpet of purple with only a thin row in between them. The sage brushed against their legs as they went down one of the rows. Near the far left corner was a large weeping willow tree. Jessie led the way there and they tied up the horses. Jessie pulled out a quilt he had brought and spread it on the ground. So tell me about your family. Kate sat, curling her legs to the side. What do you want to know? Honestly? Jessie lifted an eyebrow, and when Kate nodded, he continued. Well, I want to know what happened that made you want to be a mail-order bride. He hoped she wouldn't consider that too personal of a question. It seems as if you had an established life and family there in Boston, and there is so much unknown out here. Kate tilted her head and pursed her lips. Well, it wasn't in my grand plan, if that's what you are wondering though I am not sure what was. I loved learning, and I loved writing, but the right man never came along. I received two proposals of marriage. One was from a lecherous older man, and the other from a non-Christian. I couldn't bring myself to marry either of them. My father caught a case of influenza that he never recovered from. I stayed with my mother to help out while my brother finished college, but she never fully recovered from my father's death, and a few months later, she passed away as well. With my father being unable to work for many months, the house rent wasn't met, and I was forced to move out and rely on the mercy of my brother Robert. It might not have been so bad, but Robert had just gotten married, and his wife detested having to take me in. With the lack of any new proposals, I decided to try something different. 
Jesse's heart ached at her words. Though his story was different from hers, he could relate to the pain of loss she suffered, but he was amazed at how steadfast she remained. I'm sorry you had to go through all of that. She paused and traced a pattern on the quilt before meeting his gaze again. Will you tell me something about you now? I guess that's only fair. Jessie hoped she wouldn't ask about Pauline. She knew how Pauline had been killed, but he didn't want to share how they'd met or how he'd fallen in love with her. How did you end up in Sage Creek? Internally, he sighed with relief at the topic of her question. I was actually born in the East like you. We lived there until I was about 15 when my little sister died. My father took it hard and decided to move us out West. But my mother had a weak immune system. She died a year later, and I couldn't forgive my father. I moved out here when I was old enough to make it on my own. Have you spoken to your father since? Kate asked in a quiet voice. I tried to a few years ago when I accepted Christ, wanting to make amends, but he had passed away a few years after I left, so I've been on my own ever since. Silence fell between the two until Kate said softly, I guess we have each other now. Jessie looked at her and smiled. Yes, I guess we do. Would you like to go have lunch at the cafe today? I'd like that, Kate said. They stayed a little longer, watching the sage sway slightly in the breeze, before packing up and heading back to town. After tying up the horses outside, they stepped into the Sage Creek Cafe and chose an empty table near the front. They had just finished enjoying a meal of roast and cornbread when James's voice thundered behind them. When will you get it in your head that we don't want you and your fake replacement bride around here. Kate's eyes widened and her hand flew to her face as everyone in the cafe turned and stared at them. James, you are out of line, Jessie said standing. Kate has done nothing to you. She didn't even know Pauline. I know you miss your sister. I do too, but you have to let this go. You can't tell me what to do. James was trying to be forceful, but the slurring of his words diminished his effectiveness. Actually, James, this badge says that I'm the law, and I can tell you what to do. Now you're making a scene, and I'm asking you nicely to leave this establishment. Go home and sleep off whatever liquor you drink. James's answer was to swing a fist wildly at Jesse. It missed its target and sent James off balance. His good leg couldn't carry all the weight, and he fell to the floor with a great thud. A series of gasps and exclamations echoed throughout the room. I'm going to see if I can find someone to take him home, Jesse said to Kate. Will you wait here for me? Kate nodded, her eyes still wide. Jesse helped James stand and ushered him out the door. You aren't under arrest, James, but we're going to find someone to take you home. He wrapped an arm around the man who had almost become his brother and led him out the door. Kate watched Jesse and James exit before she allowed the tears that had been building up in her eyes to fall. She had finally been starting to feel like she was being accepted, but James's outburst shattered that image. Would she always have to be reminded she wasn't Jesse's first choice? and was only his wife because Pauline had been killed? Don't listen to him, a voice to her right said. Kate looked up to see a young female waitress looking down at her. The woman appeared about Kate's age, maybe a year or two younger, with dark hair and brown eyes. I'm Sarah Miller, and I work here at the cafe. I want you to know that we don't all feel like James does. We miss Pauline. But from what Miss Ellen says, you're a wonderful person. If she vouches for you, it's only a matter of time before everyone sees what she does. I, for one, am glad you're here. It's nice to have another woman close to my age around, and I do hope we can become friends. Thank you. Kate wiped her cheek and sniffed back tears. 
I don't know if I can keep dealing with so much hatred. Yes, you can. James doesn't hate you. He's just grieving. What you need is to get involved with the rest of the women in town. There's a social this Sunday after church. There will be dancing and food and a recipe swap. If you come, I promise you will find more people who feel like I do. Kate wiped her eyes again and smiled at the girl. Thank you. I'll take you up on that. I haven't met many people my own age, and I could certainly use socialization. Sarah patted her arm. I've got to get back to work, but I look forward to talking with you more on Sunday. Kate realized as Sarah walked away that she had not asked Jesse's permission before agreeing, but she hoped that he would not be opposed. He returned a few minutes later with an apologetic smile. I am so sorry about James. One day I hope he will forgive me. Did you have any issues while I was gone? Kate shook her head. No, in fact, Sarah Miller invited me to a social after church this Sunday. I told her I could come. I... Her eyes dropped to the ground. I hope that is agreeable. Jessie placed a finger under her chin to lift her face. It is more than agreeable. I was going to suggest it myself, and I cannot imagine a nicer woman for you to get acquainted with than Sarah Miller. I'm so glad you are amenable. Kate's eyes held his, and a flutter erupted in her stomach. Something was shifting between them, and she could not wait to see where this led. Chapter 15 Excitement fluttered in Kate's stomach when Sunday morning dawned. Though the social wasn't until after church, she had gotten everything ready the night before. She pulled back the sides of her raven locks and secured them with combs, letting the rest of the hair flow freely around her shoulder. As this was her first social and after church, she had picked one of her nicer dresses, unsure of what to expect. When she was satisfied with her appearance, she glided into the main room. Jessie looked up from the table where he was reading. You look lovely, Kate. She did not miss the appreciation in his voice and twirled for him. I'm not overdressed? He chuckled. Maybe a little, but I don't think anyone will mind. Are you ready then? Wait, one more thing. Kate hurried back into the bedroom and grabbed the recipe cards she had written out the night before for the recipe swap. It had been a painstaking and tiring process, and she'd had to stop often to shake out her cramped hand. But she had a stack of cards to swap for today, and she was excited to obtain some new recipes to try for Jessie. She just hoped she had enough. Having never attended a social, she wasn't sure exactly what to expect. With the papers in hand, she hurried back to the kitchen and grabbed the bread she had baked the previous day to share. Now I'm ready. Jesse smiled and shut his book. Let's get going then. Kate could not keep the bounce from her step as she followed Jesse to the wagon. A little excited, are you? He asked, helping her up. I can't help it. Not that I don't enjoy your company, but it has been a few days since I have been able to enjoy the company of other women. And being able to obtain new recipes is delightful. I like your current recipes, but I have no doubt that anything you make will be delicious. Kate felt her cheeks burn again, and she wondered if she would ever tire of hearing Jessie compliment her. The rest of the ride into town was quiet, but far from uncomfortable. The silence that sat between them now was a companionable one that neither felt the need to fill with unnecessary words. They arrived at the church and found their seats. Kate was a little surprised to not see Ellen, and she hoped her friend would make an appearance at the social. Though Kate normally loved church, she found it hard to sit through the service today. She was too excited to socialize with other young women her age, and she couldn't remember the last time she had danced. 
Jesse turned to her as she fidgeted in the seat yet again and smiled as he whispered, The time doesn't go any faster the more you move. I know, I'm sorry. Kate forced her hands to remain still in her lap for the remainder of the service. When the final hymn was sung, she stood and glanced eagerly towards the door, but a parade of people standing and chatting blocked the path to the exit. She was forced to swallow her impatience once more, post a smile on her face, and exchange pleasantries as the line slowly filed out of the church. As the social was being held in the barn, not far from the church, and the weather was fair, they decided to walk, but Kate had to stop at the wagon to grab her bread and cards. Then they joined the rest of the people heading toward the barn. It appeared nearly everyone in Sage Creek came out for socials. As they neared the entrance of the barn, Sarah waved from the doorway. Kate, she called, hurrying over. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Me too. Kate smoothed her skirt with her free hand as she glanced around. Though I'm a little nervous. There's no need to be. I promise this will be a friendly crowd. Right, deputy? Sarah turned to Jesse. Yes, ma'am. Jesse nodded. The bartender has agreed to make sure no one from the saloon wanders over after too many drinks. Kate knew he was referring to James, who still seemed to be harboring a grudge against them both. But she didn't mind. Today she was going to enjoy herself and not worry about James. Come on! Sarah tugged on Kate's arm. Kate looked to Jesse, not sure what the protocol was. He nodded and smiled. Go on. I'm going to walk around and check the surroundings, and then I'll come find you. After saying goodbye to Jesse, she followed Sarah into the barn. There was a small band playing the banjo and harmonica on one side of the barn for the couples that wanted to dance. At the far back was a table filled with food, and on the left, tables had been set up for the recipe swap and general mingling. Let's drop your bread off first and then grab a table. Sarah pulled Kate toward the back. Kate laughed and followed Sarah's lead. For the first time in a long time, she felt lighthearted and carefree. Kate, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Kate turned to see Ellen coming toward them. I wanted to apologize for James's behavior the other day. She pulled Kate in for a hug. When I heard what happened, I wanted to come and see you right away, but Iris has been sick. Kate's hand flew to her chest. Oh no, is she all right? Yes, I think it's just exhaustion. She had been going nonstop to try and forget Pauline's death, but when I finally made her take a break, her body told her she needed more rest. I think it's partly why James has been drinking more lately. I'm afraid he thinks he's going to lose her too. I was hoping maybe you could pray for all of us. I've been doing it, but I'm so new to this that I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Kate placed a hand on Ellen's arm. There's no wrong way to do it, but I'd be happy to, Ellen. She glanced at Sarah before turning back to Ellen. Why don't you join Sarah and me for the recipe swap? Ellen glanced over at the other young girl, but she shook her head. No, I may be young at heart, but I think you need to be with women closer to your own age today. You girls have fun. Kate felt badly as her friend walked away, but before she could react, Sarah pulled her over to the recipe swap area. What did you bring? The excitement bubbling in Sarah's voice was contagious. My mother's famous cornbread recipe. Kate pulled her cards out. What did you bring? A bread pudding recipe. I'm a much better baker than a cook, which is odd since my folks own the cafe, right? No, I understand that, Kate said. My mother loved to sew, but she always dragged me to the general store with her when she picked out fabric. Sometimes she would spend hours looking through the new fabric. 
I hated sewing growing up. I am still not very good at it. But perhaps there's hope for me yet? Sarah asked with a small smile. Kate chuckled. Wait until you get married and have to be the cook. You'll learn real fast. The girls laid out their cards and then meandered through the tables, scanning and picking up cards for other mouth-watering recipes. Kate was pleased to find a few for main dishes, as that was her weakness. When they had gathered all the cards, they walked to the back table to try some of the tantalizing food. The display was eclectic, with everything from chili to savory desserts. After filling a plate with a little of everything, they headed back toward the table, but Jesse intercepted them on the way. Perhaps Miss Miller can put your plate on the table for you, as I'd like to dance with you. He took her plate and passed it to Sarah before propelling Kate to the dance floor. I can't remember the last time I danced, Kate began, as Jessie moved her in a circle around the floor. I've never been very good. A look of chagrin crossed his features. I hope I don't step on your toes. Well, even if you do, I think I could forgive you. Kate smiled up at him, enjoying the feel of his hand on her waist. He said nothing, but as he returned her smile, Kate realized again how handsome he was. His nose wasn't exactly straight, but it complemented his strong jaw, and the warmth of his brown eyes softened the chiseled lines of his face. As the slower beat of the first song ended and a faster one began, Jesse didn't let go of her, but upped his tempo in turning her around the floor. He managed to only step on her toes once, but the look of intense concentration on his face tickled Kate so much that when the song ended, she found herself flushed and out of breath. Can we go outside for a minute of fresh air? She asked, fanning her face with her hand. Jessie nodded and, taking her arm, led her outside. The cooler air tamed the heat on her face and neck but did nothing for her parched throat. She cleared her throat, trying to ease the dryness that had taken root. A look of concern crossed Jessie's features. Would you like some punch? I would be happy to fetch you some. I would love that, Kate said. If you do not mind, I think I will stay out here to catch my breath and cool down. As Jessie ducked back into the barn, Kate leaned against the old rail fence and closed her eyes. Her trip out west may not have started on the best foot, but she was certainly content with it today. You're a hard woman to find, Miss Whidby. Kate's eyes snapped open at the dark, throaty voice that did not belong to her husband. Brown eyes met her gaze, but they were not the warm chocolate pools of Jessie's eyes. They were instead a harsh and unforgiving brown like the desert, and they looked at her over the barrel of a Colt revolver. My name isn't Whidbey any longer. Kate forced bravado into her voice. It's Jennings. You think just because you married someone else you don't belong to me? A cold, cruel sound escaped his throat, turning Kate's blood cold. I paid for you to come here. I own you. And if you were stupid enough to marry someone else, then it will be easy enough to end his life and free you up again. Why do you want a wife anyway? Kate retorted. Did you expect I would start robbing with you or just turn a blind eye? I expected you would do what I told you to do. You would cook my meals and clean my house and fulfill your other wifely duties. Kate shivered at the insinuation in his words. She could not imagine ever sharing a house with the man in front of her, much less a bed. You were stupid to come here. The sheriff and his men are looking for you. Bill Easterly shook his head and chuckled. I'm not stupid by any means. Do you think I don't know there are men looking for me? That's why I chose now. Everyone is inside at the festivities, including the sheriff and his men. So there's no one patrolling today. Once I found you, it was just a matter of playing the waiting game. Now, let's get moving. 
He motioned with the revolver for her to move. Kate glanced back toward the barn. It was too loud inside for anyone to hear her if she screamed, at least not before Easterly took care of her. But Jesse had just gone in for drinks. What was taking him so long? I don't think she'll be going anywhere with you. Kate sighed with relief at the sound of Jessie's voice, but it was short-lived as Bill grabbed her arm and swung her against his chest as he turned around. She saw just a flicker of fear enter Jessie's eyes as she was made into a human shield. I think I'll be making the rules here, Bill snarled. Besides, why does she even matter to you? I'm sure you only married her for convenience. The smell radiating off Bill was sour and acrid, and Kate could feel his sweat from the arm wrapped around her seeping into her dress. She does matter to me. Jesse's voice was even, and he met Kate's eyes for a moment before returning his attention to Easterly. But more than that, you are also responsible for killing my fiancé and one of our deputies, so I'm taking you in one way or another. Your fiancé? Easterly paused, as if trying to remember. Oh, you mean the pretty blonde who was shot when we robbed the bank. I can see why you'd be upset about that. She looked like she could keep a man happy. Unfortunate, but those things happen from time to time. Kate saw the vein in Jesse's neck tighten. She had no idea how good of a shot he was, or how accurate Bill was, but she also wasn't sure how much longer Jesse could keep his composure, with Bill speaking ill of Pauline. What she was sure of, though, was that due to her height, Bill's left arm wasn't able to reach across her chest enough to pin her right arm down, and she knew that his right arm had recently been injured. She just hoped Jesse would remember and understand her gesture. When Kate was sure she had Jesse's eye, she flicked her eyes to the right in hopes he would remember Bill's injury. Then, closing her eyes and praying, she flung her right arm up as hard and as fast as she could. When it collided with Bill's right arm, she felt his left loosen and she dropped to the ground as one, then two gunshots went off. Kate clasped her hands over her ears as they began to ring from the noise and looked around. Bill lay on the ground behind her, a pool of red spreading across his chest. His eyes still held a look of shock. She turned to where Jesse should be standing, but he was also on the ground. Jesse! She scrambled over to him, coughing as the gun smoke filled her lungs. There was no blood on his chest but she ran her hands over it all the same, feeling frantically for a wound. When her hands reached his face, his eyes fluttered and then opened. Kate Whidbey, that was either the dumbest thing or the bravest thing I've ever seen anyone do. Kate smacked his chest, causing him to grunt. Do not scare me like that. I thought you were dead, and my name is Kate Jennings. So it is, he said with a smile. Moments later, they were surrounded by people as half the town spilled out of the barn and peppered them with questions. Jeb and another man helped remove the body of Bill Easterly as Sheriff Johnson helped Jesse up. You're bleeding, Kate gasped as she saw a red spot form in his sleeve. It's just a scratch, Jesse offered her an encouraging smile. You knocked his arm wide enough that his bullet just grazed me. We still better get it looked at, Sheriff Johnson said. Everyone else can return to the social. The danger here is taken care of. The crowd stepped back a few feet, but no one seemed eager to hurry back into the barn. The excitement still hung in the air, and the people murmured amongst each other, trying to guess what had happened. Doc Moore emerged from the crowd and led the way to his office, Emma following close behind. Let's get that shirt off, Jesse, and take a look at that arm. He motioned for Jesse to take a seat on the cot in the room. Jesse had barely felt the graze, 
But as he lifted his arm to begin unbuttoning his shirt, an achy sensation descended on his arm. He tried not to grimace, but from the look on Kate's face as she watched, he hadn't been entirely successful. After another few jabs of pain, he managed to get his sleeve off. While Doc Moore examined and cleaned the wound, Jessie's eyes drifted to Kate. She was so unlike Pauline, not only from her dark hair and blue eyes, but to her personality. He couldn't imagine Pauline doing what Kate had done. Though he still loved Pauline, he figured he always would. He realized that little room in his heart for Kate had grown as well. Maybe in not quite the same way, but Jesse thought their marriage could not only be successful, but happy and fulfilling as well. You're very lucky, Doc Moore said as he wound the bandage around Jesse's arm. The bullet missed your bone, but it did go through a little of your muscle. It will heal, but you may be sore for a month or so, and you should take it easy with this arm for at least that long. Yes, sir. Jesse nodded. He was glad to see the fear had gone from Kate's eyes at the doctor's proclamation of his health. I know you said you weren't injured, Kate, Doc Moore said, turning to her. But I'd like to check your ears and do a quick examination to be sure. As Kate nodded, Jessie and the sheriff exited the office to give her some privacy. I'm sure Ellen will let him know, but I suppose I better find James and tell him we got Pauline's killer, the sheriff said. Actually, sir, would it be all right if I did that? Jessie asked. We've had our share of disagreements, but I'd really like to be the one to give him the news. The sheriff nodded, and a moment later the door opened and Kate exited. I'll walk with you, Sheriff Johnson said, as I'm sure he's in the saloon and Miss Kate doesn't need to be in there. Where are we going? Kate asked. To tell James we got Easterly, Jesse said. What about the last guy, though? Kate glanced from Jesse to the sheriff and back. We won't give up looking for him, but I have no doubt that Easterly was responsible for Pauline's death so we can at least give James some peace, the sheriff said, stepping into the saloon. Kate placed a hand on Jesse's arm. I know you probably know better than I do, but I am not sure we should say anything to James until we know the third man is taken care of. What if he decides to come back or find new men to ride with him? Jesse placed his hand over Kate's. He could understand her hesitation, and he harbored a little of it himself. He had actually forgotten there was a third man. But if Easterly had killed one partner, perhaps he had killed the other as well. It will be okay. You heard what the sheriff said. We will not stop looking for him. A moment later, they heard James's deep voice protesting. I don't want to see Jesse. You will for this came the sheriff's voice. James's sullen face appeared in the doorway, followed by Sheriff Johnson. James, I know you blame me for Pauline's death, Jesse began, but I promised her I would find her killer. I wanted to let you know that we did. His name was Bill Easterly, and he came here tonight. But with Kate's help, he flashed her a smile. We were able to outsmart him. He's dead, James. It's over. James looked from Jesse to Kate to the sheriff. Though he had obviously been drinking, his face sobered. He's dead. You really got him. Jesse nodded, surprised to see liquid forming in James's eyes. Good, James said, and walked back into the saloon. Jesse watched him go and shook his head. Now you two go home and get some rest, Sheriff Johnson said to Jesse and Kate. But I want you both at the office tomorrow to give your account of what happened. I'll make sure James gets home. Yes, sir. As Jesse turned to Kate, he held out his good hand. I guess we better follow orders and get on home. There's no place I'd rather be. Kate smiled up at him as she put her hand in his. Chapter 16 
Kate smiled as Jessie helped her down from the wagon. She could not believe how close she had come to losing him tonight, and she wanted to tell him that she cared and that she was ready for the relationship to progress, but she wasn't sure how. That was some night tonight, wasn't it? Jessie asked, holding on to her hand. She met his gaze, wondering if this was his way of telling her that he cared for her as well. Yes, it was, and I didn't like nearly losing you tonight. I didn't like nearly losing you either. He pulled her closer and wrapped his arm around her waist. I know we started this marriage as one of convenience, but I care for you, Kate. She placed a hand on his cheek. I care for you, too. He held her gaze for a moment before his eyes closed and his face inched closer to hers. In her chest, the beating of her heart doubled, and all she could hear was the thudding in her ears. She had wondered for days what Jessie's lips would feel like against her own, and when they met hers, they did not disappoint. Kate's knees grew weak as warmth spread through her body. Then suddenly there was a thud, and Jessie's warmth slipped away. Kate opened her eyes and screamed. Then her world went dark as well. When she opened her eyes again, a deep, throbbing pain erupted in her head. She tried to bring her hand to her head, but realized she couldn't move it. Why couldn't she move her hand? Then she realized she was no longer outside, but in the cabin. She was tied to one chair, and Jesse was tied to the other. His eyes were still closed. Jesse? Jesse, are you okay? He is for now. The harsh voice made her turn, and the stabbing in her head intensified. The room swam, and she was forced to blink a few times before the man came into view. Kate did not recognize the face, but her instincts told her this was the last robber. You are a mighty feisty woman, the man said, as he leaned against the doorframe that led to the bedroom. He was older, with a weathered face and some silver in his hair. I told Bill he should have just let you go, but he wouldn't do it. That boy always did have a stubborn streak. Boy? Bill Easterly was no boy, but this man spoke as if he was, which could only mean... He was your son? The man's eyes flashed. Yes, he was, and you took him from me. Took my other son, Robert, too. I don't know what you are speaking of. I know no Robert. Oh, maybe not with your hands you didn't take him. But he didn't want Bill to come after you. They got in a fight, and Bill's gun went off. Kate bit the inside of her lip. Robert had been the other robber and the one Jesse had found in Bill's cabin that day. So the way I see it, you have been nothing but trouble since you got here. You are responsible for the deaths of both my boys, and now I am going to enjoy watching you pay. He pulled out a match, and Kate's stomach twisted. He was going to burn down the cabin, with her and Jesse in it. Even if she could find a way to escape herself, she would never be able to get Jesse out, not with him unconscious. So Kate did the only thing she could think of. She began screaming. It took the man by surprise at first, but then his shock turned into a smile and then a chuckle. There's no one to hear you scream out here, darling. You're too far from town and neighbors. If your man were awake, I'd thank him. I couldn't have picked a better place myself. With that, he struck the match and tossed it on the couch. Then he turned and walked out of the cabin. Kate continued screaming as she watched the match, hoping it wouldn't catch. But it did, and slowly the flames began devouring the couch. Jesse, Jesse, you have to wake up. She screamed his name and tugged at the ropes on her wrist, but it was no use. They had been tied tightly and Jesse showed no signs of stirring. The fire had engulfed so much of the couch now that she could feel the heat filling the room. Oh God, please don't let us die this way. 
Please send someone to save us. Smoke began filling the room and pressing in on Kate's throat. Her eyes burned, and she was forced to stop screaming, but she did not stop fighting. She continued to pull at the ropes binding her hands and her ankles and rocking the chair back and forth. The motion made her head hurt even more, but she could not stop. Stopping would mean certain death. The sound of gunfire outside sent Kate's heart rate through the roof. Would Easterly's father come back? Had he injured someone else? As the fire jumped from the couch to the rug, she swung all her weight to the left and then to the right, pushing with her toes as she did. The chair tipped, teetered, and then fell to the floor, causing Kate's teeth to snap together and her head to bounce against the floor. A sharp pain in her arm joined the intensified throbbing in her head, but she continued to twist. This time, she heard a cracking sound and felt a little give. But would it be enough time? The fire was already licking across the floor toward them. Kate closed her eyes, sent a prayer for strength, and pulled. Another creak and groan filled the air, but the chair didn't break. Tears filled her eyes and slid down her cheek. She didn't want to die this way, not without seeing her brother again and not without telling Jesse she loved him. Suddenly, the door to the cabin burst open, and Kate shut her eyes tighter. It had to be Easterly's father, and she had no doubt he would finish the job with his gun, just in case the fire didn't. Oh, heavens. Kate? Jesse? Are you here? The voice sounded vaguely familiar, but she couldn't place it. Still, the man knew their names, so he had to be a friend. Here! We're over here! She called out, before a coughing spasm hit her. The thick smoke burned her throat and obscured her vision, but she tried to peer through it to find their angel anyway. In the kitchen! There were footsteps, and then a man's face filled her vision. James? What was he doing here? Hang on, Kate. Sheriff, in here. A round of coughing afflicted him as well, and he pulled his shirt over his nose and mouth. The sheriff was here too? While she had no idea why James and the sheriff were at their homestead, she was relieved. Get Jesse. He's unconscious. Did you get the man? There will be time for questions later the sheriff said, appearing in the smoke. Right now, it's time to move. He pulled a knife from his boot and cut the rope from her hands and feet. Then he passed the knife to James so he could do the same for Jesse. Can you walk? The sheriff asked, holding out a hand. Kate had no idea if she could, but she nodded. She would certainly try. Pain shot through her right arm and leg as she stood, but she didn't think anything was broken. She allowed the sheriff to support her and hobbled out with him, hollering for James to hurry. As soon as they were out of the cabin, the cool night air enveloped her, and she inhaled deeply, causing her throat to spasm with coughs once again. But she was alive. She followed the sheriff to a spot a safe distance from the cabin and looked back toward the door in search of Jesse. A moment later, James appeared with Jesse slung over his shoulder. Though he limped, James carried her husband to them before setting him down. Did you get the man? Kate asked when her coughing subsided. We did. He won't be hurting anyone anymore. Do you know who he was? Kate nodded. He said he was Bill Easterly's father. Evidently, Bill and his brother Robert got in an argument about coming after me. Bill killed Robert, the man you found at Easterly's house. Then his father saw Jesse kill Bill. He blamed me for both deaths, and he must have followed us home, because we were attacked shortly after arriving. The sheriff nodded, but his eyes remained fixed on the cabin, now slowly going up in flames. I'm sorry we didn't get here in time to save your house. Me too. Kate thought of all the things she'd just gotten back, only to lose again and another tear raced down her cheek. Is there nothing we can do? He shook his head. 
The three of us couldn't get water on the house fast enough, and no one else would make it here in time. Thankfully, there is little wind, and the recent rain should protect it from spreading to the barn. Kate sighed, but she knew he was right. Jesse will be devastated, but they are only things. I am glad that you arrived when you did. Can I ask, though, what made you come out here? The sheriff turned to the larger man who had been quiet. You actually have James to thank for that. He wanted to apologize for being so short with Jesse after hearing the news tonight. But I was afraid a fight might ensue between the two, so I insisted on coming with him. We arrived just as the man was fleeing the cabin. We were going to question him, but his reply was gunfire, so we were forced to return it in defense. Kate turned to James and placed a hand on his arm. Thank you. I know you don't like me that much, and you don't agree with Jesse marrying me, but you are a good man for this. James grunted. You're welcome, and I don't dislike you. I don't even know you. I dislike the situation, and I miss my sister. But I'm sorry I took my anger out on you. He looked back toward the cabin. And I'm sorry that Jesse lost his place. We will help him rebuild. The sheriff agreed. Yes, we will. But right now, we need to get the two of you to Doc Moore's to get checked out. I'll get the wagon. James limped over to where the horse whinnied and stomped her feet. A few minutes later, James returned, helped Kate and Jesse into the back, and then climbed in the front with the sheriff. Kate placed Jesse's head on her lap and stroked his hair, careful to avoid the large bump that was forming. She knew her injuries were mainly physical. And while they would take a few days to recover from, she had no doubt she would recover. But she had no idea about Jesse's injuries. Lord, please let him be okay, she whispered, as the wagon bumped toward the town. Chapter 17 The pounding in Jesse's head was fierce when he opened his eyes. Then the pain registered. He could feel it in his hands, his feet, his hip, and even his ribs. What had happened? Glad to see you're awake. He turned his head to see the beautiful face of his wife, although a dark bruise marred its perfection and Emma, who helped out around the clinic occasionally and had addressed him. How long have I been here? A few hours. Kate grabbed his hand. You took a nasty hit to the head. It looks like you did too. He tried to reach up to touch her forehead, but everything hurt too badly. Who attacked us? Easterly's father. He was the third robber. Evidently, he followed us home from the social. Guilt gripped Jesse's insides. This was his fault. He should have listened to Kate when she said he was celebrating too early. Maybe if he had, he would have been paying more attention to his surroundings. I'm sorry. Did the sheriff get him? Are you okay? Kate smiled, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. I'm okay. And yes, he's dead. My shoulder and hip are a little bruised, but the house is gone, Jesse. What? He struggled to sit up, but Kate pressed a hand on his chest to keep him still. How can it be gone? Easterly's father tied us to the chairs after he knocked us out. He waited until I came to so he could gloat about what he was doing. Then he struck a match and tossed it on the couch. The house caught fire. Jessie shook his head slowly, trying to make sense of her words through the pain. I don't understand. If the house burned down and we were tied up, how did we escape? This time, Kate's smile touched her eyes. James saved us. Well, him and the sheriff. He came to apologize, and they arrived right after the fire was set. He carried you out and he's offered to help you rebuild. Jesse blinked. He must be hearing her wrong, or still confused, because there was no way Pauline's brother would do any such thing. 
Are you sure it was James? Pauline's brother James? Yes, I'm sure. Now, the doctor says you took a hard hit to your head and you will need to rest for the next few days. But otherwise, you can leave the clinic. But to where? He asked. You just told me that we no longer have a home. Kate held up a finger and crossed to the door. A second later, Martha and Clark entered the doorway. You'll stay with us until the new homestead is finished. No, we can't. You need the money as much as any of us. We won't occupy a room you could be making money on. Martha smiled and shook her head. We are getting paid, so don't you worry your little head about it. How? My money was in the house, and Kate's was stolen on the way here. Martha and Clark stepped aside, and James stepped in. It's coming from my family and the rest of the town. I done you wrong, Jesse, and I'm sorry. I see now that you were only doing what you thought was best for Pauline, and you kept your promise. You avenged her death. My family had a little money saved that they were going to give the two of you on your wedding day. It's paying for your room now, and I took up a collection at the saloon. That's paying for some, too. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Emotion constricted Jesse's throat, but he swallowed it down. Thank you, James. Thank you for saving us. And I forgive you. I always did. A moment of emotional silence filled the room, and then everyone began bustling about. James tipped his hat and disappeared out the door. Martha and Clark bid farewell and assured him the room was ready when they were, and then they left as well. Emma disappeared out the back, and only Kate remained. She crossed back to the cot he was stretched out on. Would you like me to help you up? Jesse accepted her help and slowly made it to his feet. It would definitely be a few days before he felt like himself again. He grabbed her hands. Kate, I'm so sorry our house is gone. I was supposed to protect you, and I failed. Kate smiled and shook her head. You didn't fail. No one could have known he was watching us or that he would follow us. And I know you are worried about the house, but that structure was not our home, Jesse. Home is any place we can be together. Though pain still coursed through him, Jesse pulled Kate to him and placed his lips softly on hers. He did not deserve her, but he could not be happier that God had sent her into his life. When the kiss ended, she smiled up at him. Shall we go get settled in our new temporary home? They had nothing but the clothes on their backs, so Jesse had no idea what the next few weeks or months would look like. But with Kate by his side, and friends like Martha, Clark, and James behind him, he had no doubt that things would work out. Epilogue Jesse smiled as he glanced over at Kate. He'd tied a cloth around her eyes to keep them shut as he led her to the new homestead. It wasn't the only surprise he had planned for her today, but it was the first and probably most important. Are you ready? Considering I am unsure what to be ready for, I find it hard to answer the question, but I suppose I am as ready as I can be. She smiled hesitantly. Keep your eyes closed until I say to open them, he said as he untied the cloth. He wanted to be sure and see her reaction when she saw the new house for the first time. All right, open them. Her eyes opened, and her hand flew to her mouth as it dropped open. It's finished? It is. Jesse had not expected the dwelling to be finished this soon, but many of the men in town had helped when they could, allowing the construction to progress faster than normal. It wasn't much different from the original homestead, except for the additional space, and the flat roof that he hoped would allow him to build a second floor one day. It's beautiful. Can I see the inside? Of course. Jesse pressed his lips together to hide his smile, 
Many of their friends were waiting inside the house to surprise her even more. Ellen and Sarah had rallied the women to help decorate the inside, and the men had helped Jesse build the furniture. He hoped she wouldn't be too disappointed sharing this experience with her friends. She admired the porch and the railing as they approached the front door, and when he opened the door, her hand flew to her chest when the clapping and cheers carried out. What is this? She asked the question quietly, leaning closer so only he could hear her words. Your friends were disappointed that they didn't get to come to our wedding and that our last night of dancing was cut short. Besides, they helped get this place ready, so I thought it only fitting that they help us celebrate. I hope that's okay. Kate smiled at him and squeezed his hand. It is more than okay. Thank you. Welcome home and congratulations, Sarah cried, running over to Kate and enveloping her in a hug. You do know we've been married for months now, right, Miss Miller? Jesse asked. Sarah shot him a look. Yes, but now you have a wonderful new house as well. Kate, I cannot wait to show you all we did. She grabbed Kate's hand to take her around the room, and Jesse smiled as he watched her eyes light up at each new thing. A slight thud sounded, and a large hand landed on his shoulder. James's foot was nearly healed, but evidently the break had been bad enough that he would have a slight limp the rest of his life. I think the house turned out well, Jesse, James began. Thank you for letting me help. Jesse shook his head. I couldn't have done it without you, so thank you. He shook hands with a few more of the men before making his way closer to Kate to hear her reaction to the women's surprise. Do you like the decorating? Sarah asked. We all helped. It's beautiful, Sarah. Thank you so much. Jessie was not surprised to see a sheen in her eyes. He had no doubt she was fighting back tears, but he sucked in a breath when he saw Rebecca step forward. She'd been the most outspoken opponent of Kate as Pauline's best friend. I don't think we've officially met, Rebecca said. She didn't offer a hand, though. They stayed behind her back. I'm Rebecca, and Pauline was my best friend. I'm sorry for the way I've treated you, and I wanted... She looked around her. We wanted to tell you how brave we think you are. We all admire you. She brought her arms forward, revealing a wrapped package. Kate took the package and looked around at all the women. Open it! they said. Kate tore the paper back and lifted the lid. Inside was a beautiful quilt. We each brought a square of fabric from home and sewed it together, Sarah said. It's a wedding quilt for your bed. We work on these during our quilting bees. I'm sorry we couldn't invite you this time, but we hope you'll join us for the next one. This time, a tear did sneak out of Kate's eye and trickled down her cheek as she regarded each of the women in front of her. Thank you. Emotion choked her voice. This means so much to me. Well, you mean a great deal to us, Ellen said, coming to her side. Jessie stepped to her other side and whispered in her ear. See, I told you they'd love you when they got to know you. Kate nodded and leaned into him. Shall I go and put this on the bed? Ellen asked, taking the quilt from Kate's arms. Thank you. On that note, I think it is time for cake, Sarah said, before she hurried to the kitchen. A few of the women went with her, and minutes later, slices of cake began circling the room. This is wonderful, Jessie. Thank you for the surprise. Is it really all right? I wondered about letting other women decorate for you, but Sarah and Ellen seemed confident they would know what you liked. She smiled and shook her head. They did a wonderful job. I don't think I could have done a better one myself, and I am very glad to be back in our home. Me too. As nice as it was for Clark and Martha to help them out, he was ready to return to a homestead as well. Oh, 
I almost forgot. This came for you at the post office today. He pulled an envelope from his pocket and handed it to her. Her eyes lit up as she read the name on the envelope. It's from my brother. That's wonderful. He wrapped an arm around her waist. How are they doing? She opened the letter and scanned it quickly, her eyes widening as she read. Well, she said with a mischievous smile, it turns out I'm going to be an aunt soon. He tightened his grip on her waist and tugged her closer. That is good news indeed, and it reminds me of something I'd like to ask you. What is that? Kate asked with a tilt of her head. Well, with Easterly taken care of, and things calming down in town, I wanted to ask you what you thought of motherhood. I think it's a very noble profession, Kate said, biting back her smile. Indeed it is, he said, but I suppose my question was more, would you like to be a mother? I would like that very much, Deputy Jennings. This time she didn't bother to hold back the smile. As would I. Their gazes locked for the briefest of moments, and then Jesse leaned his head down to touch Kate's lips with his own. The End The journey to Sage Creek isn't over. Keep reading to find out Emma's story and meet the rest of her family. This has been An Unexpected Love Sage Creek Romance Book One Written by Lorena Hoops Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2022. This has been An Unexpected Love. Written by Lorena Hoops. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2022.